salatu wa salam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتحة لما أغلق والخاتمة لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق الهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سحلا إلا ما جعلته سحلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إلى شيء سهلا سهلا اللهم عيتنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome everyone to the final class of foundations of the spiritual path I want to once again thank Asada Fadwa and everybody uh, who's a part of the Rahma Foundation for facilitating this session. It was only supposed to be four weeks and we are way past that. Alhamdulillah, because this text is just so incredible. There's so much uh, to cover. So Alhamdulillah, they gave us ample time to do that. And here we are at the very final class. Alhamdulillah, it's been an honor. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead. And for those who are on Instagram, because I'm also broadcasting there, you're welcome to join the Foundation's uh, Zoom session um, through Rahma Foundation. So please contact Rahma Foundation. I'm not able to uh, multitask right now and give you links, but if you just go to the Rahma Foundation page, you should be able to get all that information. And it's a very simple registration process. But let me go ahead and um, screen share so that we can all inshallah, read along. So alhamdulillah, as I mentioned two weeks ago, because last week, of course, we had our uh, break uh, for Memorial uh, Weekend, Memorial Day weekend. So we did not have a session last week, but the week before, right when we came to the end of the council from Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, we uh, ended on this note here where he mentions that this document is so essential that we should be actually reading it every single day, right? Everything we covered for the past, uh, how many, eight, nine weeks, 10 weeks that we've been talking about this document, he felt, Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, that it was so relevant uh, that we should be actually reading it every day. And I, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of, mashallah, um, things that we we do, we, we pray, inshallah, we all pray our prayers, we read Quran, we do our awrad. So yes, it might seem like, oh, we're adding more, but if you really think about, I think what he's saying by just even giving that advice, that the guidance that you find in a document like Foundations is something that should be renewed, right? Because it's very easy to lose your way. Once you start to practice for some time, um, we become stagnant. And I, if you recall, that was one of the uh, diseases of, of the heart. That's one of the things that he actually mentions leads to spiritual disease, is stagnation, spiritual stagnation. So I think what he's really saying is review, renew, make sure that you're constantly revisiting your intentions, you know, make sure that you're aware of maybe uh, patterns of, of behavior, whether you're doing things or not doing things. And also be mindful of the company that you keep, because I can't tell you uh, how many times I have been um, approached by individuals who are, you know, going through the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows, as we say, of what we would say is the experience of the vast majority of uh, of believers, right? If you you know refer to the Quran, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes the three different type of nufus, which today Subhanallah was um, my last session with some seventh graders that I teach at, at a local private school here, and we had um, a review. So Alhamdulillah, they they were able to remember the three nufus that are mentioned in the Quran: the nafs al amara bisu, the nafs al lawama, and the nafs al mutmainna. The nafs al lawama is the blaming self; it's the self-reproaching nafs. It's the where most of us would fall because we, inshallah, are believers, right? We have taqwa, inshallah. We pray, we fast, we give our zakat, we try to help, you know, people. We try to maintain good character. But because of the lives that we live, the lifestyles that we have, the so oftentimes it really does come down to the company that we keep. We may find ourselves slipping into sinfulness and forgetfulness and heedlessness. So there's a big emphasis on 
really watching the company that you keep. So he's mentioning that here, but let's now um, proceed because it's there's not that much left, but what is left is of course very also, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's worthy of review and worthy of real deep contemplation. So the first um, little box here is it's, uh, uh, it's small in, in the sense of, you know, the, the, the number of characters and words, uh, uh, but in terms of the depth of what uh, is written here, there's just so much to cover. So this is the Council of Imam Anoui. And so just for, again, those who are on Instagram, the Foundations of the Spiritual Path, which is this document that is in the Agenda to Change Our Condition, it was translated by Sheikh Hamza, is primarily the advice of Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, but within the document, there's also a short little segment that provides counsel from Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah. So here, uh, this is you know from Sheikh Hamza, he says, in addition to the above work, there is a large portion about the path to Allah that appears in the great Imam Nawawi's Al-Maqasid, which Sidi Ahmed Zarruq did not mention in his work. It is a wonderfully succinct summation of the path to Allah. So Imam Nawawi, may Allah sanctify his secret says, this is now Imam Nawawi's advice. And so what, did he, what does he say? He says, one reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most high by repenting from all things, unlawful or offensive. So if you want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to, first of all, know that you can't continue or carry on sinning and allowing for what is haram to uh, you know to be a part of your life? You have to be willing to get rid of those elements, whether they are things that are you know actual haram objects, materials, things that are preventing you uh, from uh, from being close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, or there are other things. Maybe um, as we mentioned, you are you know in a you you you're maintaining a certain lifestyle where you're allowing the haram to affect you. So the point here is to First of all, first of all, remove those things and then to repent from everything you've ever done that has been unlawful or offensive and to really take Toba seriously. You know, so what does that look like? It looks like facing yourself. It looks like what you would do if you, you know, wanted to heal or, or cleanse yourself, maybe even from a physical perspective, right? If you go to clean yourself or to remove the filth off of your face, let's say, let's say you went um, somewhere and you, you got dirty with mud. You know, there's, there's a lot of places we can go where we can get physically very dirty, right? So if you went somewhere and you got physically dirty and then you wanted to clean yourself, Part of that process would likely be looking at yourself in the mirror, right? Confronting uh, where the dirt may have gotten into and taking those extra steps to really try to cleanse away, right? Whatever the, wherever there is uh, impurities. So in a similar way, when you're doing a spiritual cleanse, you have to think about your life. You have to think about the mistakes you've made, the things you've done. And this can be over the span of your life, you know, collect, like just looking at what are, what are you, what have you done that you would consider to be a grave sin? And this goes back to, again, another, you know, uh, area of knowledge we have to have. Um, again, an, an agenda, by the way, if you don't have the book, it all has it for you. So in the agenda to change our condition is outlined the 17 kabair or enormities, right? What is considered a grave sin in Islam? And if you don't know what those things are, which, you know, again, I think if you have even a rudimentary understanding of Sharia and Islam, maybe your parents, your grandparents, your Islamic Sunday school teachers hopefully taught you enough to know, you know, what, what is considered haram. But you might need to look into, you know, a list like the one in agenda to get a more comprehensive understanding because some of the things that uh, we don't really think about, you know, I did a class uh, uh, yesterday, no, Sunday, Saturday on uh, diseases of the heart. And we, we did an entire two hours just talking about uh, the difference between riba, the difference and buhtan and namima, right? So there's riba, which is, uh, you know, saying about someone something that is, that would 
would hurt them, that you know would hurt them. And, and the, our scholars went into such great detail to give us specific examples so that we realize that we are prone to make to excusing our bad behavior by, um, you know, kind of, as they say, you know, remaining in, in the, uh, like when, when you are willfully ignorant, right, you, you're, you're not choosing to actually know the specific details or boundaries. Uh, there is a you know com complicit uh, complicitness there, right? You're you're complicit in your own sinfulness because you know that um, that there are very specific parameters, but you're just choosing not to even delve into that. So riba is actually very broad, and our uh, scholars, mashallah, took the time to tell us. For example, um, let me see if I can bring up the document that I worked with. Uh, hold on, give me a moment here. Alhamdulillah, I think I might have it already up. But this document is so rich, it's so comprehensive, because it goes into things like I mentioned, uh, for example, saying something about someone's height, saying something about someone's even possessions, right? And, you know, mashallah, again, may Allah bless our teachers. But it, it, they were very, it was very eye opening when we we're learning this, you know, years ago, even with Sheikh Hamza, when we, he, we, we did purification of the heart. And he talked about how it is considered riba to talk about the possessions of a person in a negative light, right? So if you were to describe someone's car and you were like, yeah, you know, the, 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 the one with the paint that's chipped and it's, it's pretty old and it's, it's just not, you know, it's like a lemon. And, you, and that's the description you gave to someone's vehicle. It would be considered riba by sharia because if the person heard you say that, they would take great offense, right? Because it's like, there is, you know, some, some insult there. You're trying to say something about the possession that they have, which is often an extension of what you think of them. So if you think a person is, has an ugly car or, an, uh, or doesn't dress nice, or maybe their shoes aren't very, uh, they wear, you know, shabby clothes or, or, or shoes that are dirty, if you're pointing these things out in that way, you are uh, hurting the individual indirectly because you're insulting them, right? And just think about it for a moment. It makes perfect sense uh, because otherwise you could use more neutral language. You could just say, uh, you know, they're, you know, the sister or the brother who, if you're trying to describe someone and to someone that maybe they don't know them, they don't know their name, you could use descriptors that are favorable that are pleasant, that are nice, that are kind. But when you choose to hone in on the qualities or possessions of an individual that you don't deem are, uh, are worthy um, and you use very you know, specific language to let, that, uh, to let a person know, right, uh, what you think of them, that is essentially riba. So here, this is the text, it's, um, they mention here, the mention of riba is to mention your brother who is uh, who is absent in a way which he would not like if informed. This is whether it is in regards to a bodily deficiency, such as having blurry eyes, being one-eyed, being cross-eyed, not having hair, uh, excessively tall or excessively short, uh, and the likes. So the words we use to describe people are actually, um, they do imply certain things, right? We're, we're, we're making implications uh, when we say certain words in a way. So anyhow, this is one topic, right? Barely scratching the surface of one of the acts of the enormities that we would consider sinful and we should stay away from. Now, if you know, there's 17 enormities in total, but you know, the, uh, according to, again, our, our scholars, they've counted 17. And then you know the order of what is the gravest of sins, right? Shirk, associating partners with Allah, obviously murder, uh, you know, anything that's deserving of capital punishment, these types of things are sinful, but then there's other sins as well. So <clears throat> when we say to make toba, right, which is, um, sorry, let me go back to the other document I was at. When it says here, to repent from all things unlawful or offensive, right? <clears throat> and it says very clearly, um, uh, you know, uh, sorry, th that, that first section, what it's telling us is that we have to be willing to look at the blemishes of our own character and be willing to face it, not make excuses, call a spade a spade, as they say, be like, yeah, I have committed a lot of offensive 
and uh, sinful things. I, I've, I've done a lot and may Allah forgive me. I have lied. I have uh, cheated. I have, uh, you know, um, done things that are unethical, whatever it is. You can just keep going through the list. And this is a very internal, inward spiritual process. But the point of it is that you are facing your reality. You're humbling yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're beseeching him, asking him to forgive you. And you are hyper aware of his grace because ultimately when we are in the doing the exercise of toba that's really what it's about it's that you come to that realization of how much grace allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to give you despite how sinful you are right so it then and then that turns into what this overwhelming desire to please him, you know, gratitude, this feeling of indebtedness, this feeling of, I want to be better. I want to better myself because I am undeserving, right? But I think that's why it's so, it's very um, telling that, you know, he starts off the list of things that will take us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, proximity, have marifa, have, have that knowledge of him with toba. Like do the cleanse first, purge, do it all, get yourself in the right state of mind, which is humility. And now it's being proactive in a different direction, which is seeking sacred knowledge, right? So after you do the toba and it's sincere and you know the steps of toba, right? You admit uh, that, you know, you acknowledge what you're doing is, is sinful. You seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then inshallah, you vow to never repeat those things again. And you don't, you know, those are the conditions of a sincere toba. So when you do that, then you move on to the next uh, topic here, which he says, is seeking sacred knowledge in accordance with one's needs. So wherever you are on the path, you need to know what is the next step, right? Because we are all students of knowledge. And just because you attain a certain level of mastery in one area or understanding doesn't mean that your job is done and that you're suddenly graduated from learning. No, we are lifelong learners. So from the cradle to the grave, we're supposed to be learning. So you then uh, start to, you know, figure out, do you need to work on aqidah? Do you, you have fiqh, areas of fiqh where you are negligent or just not aware? Have you learned the, how to read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? This is, these are all fardain. These are the obligatory, among uh, what the obligatory knowledge is that every Muslim will be held accountable for. Um, <clears throat> So you have to know these things. And then Imam al-Ghazali also believed that purification of the heart was part of also the fardain. You had to be doing this work constantly because, you know, again, the whole objective is that we reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having worked on ourselves. So um, all of this is to say that each person is going to have to figure out what area of knowledge they need to, uh, to gain for themselves, right? So then, <clears throat> sorry, one second. So then um, the next thing he mentions here is maintaining ritual purity. This is incredibly uh, important. Um, if it's not obvious to all of us yet, I don't know when it will be. Uh, you know, we know what month it is. This is the month of uh, one of the uh, diseases of the heart, something that we should never be celebrating. But subhanAllah, ironically, it is being it is a month of celebration and they are celebrating something that we believe to be a disease and not something, not a virtue whatsoever, but a vice, pride. But what comes with pride in today's world is also um, a degree of uh, depravity that is really hard to even imagine that these things are done in public spaces. I mean, just today I was um, accosted, my eyeballs were accosted on Twitter looking at my newsfeed because people are outraged by some of these quote unquote family friendly uh, pride parades that are happening all over the country in major cities in Los Angeles this weekend, for example. There was a horrific, truly horrific display, despicable on every level, of sex acts being performed in front of you know children. Why am I mentioning this? Because there is a demonic realm 
And if you're not aware that these demons, Shayatin uh, al-Ins, are very real, they exist. They're in plain sight now. You know, there was a time where these are shadowy figures that lurked in, you know, in, in the darkness because socially it was not acceptable to be engaged in this type of depravity. But we've come, you know, unfortunately so far uh, in, in the worst way possible from that, that now people are very open, very proud of their debauchery and their depravity, and they don't care if it offends you, if it's disgusting to you, because they are very proud of what they do. And so the demonic realm is, we believe in the unseen, the ghayb is very, it's part of our aqidah to believe that these things are real, the angelic and the demonic. And in order to protect ourselves, in order to shield ourselves from the effects and the proximity of the demonic realm, we have been given the gift, the absolute gift of wudu. Wudu uh, prepares you for spiritual ritual worship, alhamdulillah, but it also is like a barrier. It's a shield. It's a protective bubble, you could say, a spiritual protective bubble that when you maintain it, it invites the light. It invites the angelic realm. The angels are actually drawn to us when we are in a state of wudu. So to maintain your wudu, there is great hikmah in that. And you know, just to prove how these things are all connected, right? Um, the mind, the body, the soul. When we are maintaining our wudu actively, one of the ways that we have to do that is control the stomach, right? So your food intake and your drink intake actually is impacting, is impacted by the niya to maintain ritual purity. You can't go on you know, drinking abundantly or eating all the time if you want to maintain your, your wudu. You have to actually start to structure your day according to uh, you know, where, first of all, where you are, how much, you know, what type of access you have to a restroom. So it, it involves much more than just being in a state of wudu. And that's why it's so amazing because you think like, oh, okay, it's just a matter of splashing water on your on different limbs, and that's all it is. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these gifts uh, of in our worship, will do his worship in order for us to benefit in all of the ways. It's it, there's many ways that we benefit. So we'll do helps us in that way as well. When we maintain ritual purity, we so let's let's go over some of these. First, we are protected from the evil. Right, the, the demonic realm, both the shayateen and ins and inshallah the, the, the jinn. So that just the negative energy we, we inshallah will create, uh, foster a more uh, positive uh, shielded force field, you could say around us uh, for that. B, it'll help us to control our appetites, right? So you get the benefit of being more control of yourself so that you're not drinking everything and eating everything in sight. Three, you are prepared for any act of worship. If the time comes and you wanted to immediately fall into prostration and make a sajda shukran, for example, mashallah, you can do that. If you needed to read Quran, read dua, open the Quran to, to read something, you can do that. If you wanted to do many things in a state of wudu because you're already facilitated, do extra nafila, whatever it is, do dhikr, do salawat, the fact that you're already in a state of wudu, this pre, uh, you know, uh, prerequisite to our much of our worship, but you're already in it, becomes a means of facilitating it, right? Because if you think about a lot of people who have, because you know, I have worked with individuals who have a difficulty maintaining prayer, a lot of the times it's not the prayer itself, it's the wudu that becomes the source. Uh, that that causes you know some difficulty or challenge because they're at work they're at school um, they they have issues you know with with the whole wudu process or there's there's not enough time in their 15 minute lunch break or whatever it is so the constraints that affect a person's prayer are usually tied to wudu so again if the, you take this as a niya that I'm going to try my best to maintain ritual purity as often as I possibly can. Inshallah, you will reap the benefits in all of these ways and much more. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ will recognize the believers on the day of judgment on the basis of how much wudu we do. Our limbs will be illuminated according to the amount of wudu that we do and the effort that we put in in that. So the more wudu, the better. And I always, I've taught my kids and I'm very intentional about it myself 
Hamdan, uh, especially for those of us who have the luxury and the privilege to work from home, that if you use the restroom, uh, you make wudu immediately after. Don't fall into this habit of just leaving the restroom without wudu. Uh, just do it. And you'll become so habituated to it that you don't even think twice. There's no thought that comes to your mind about it because you've you know, habituated to it. And if you teach your children from a young age to do these things, inshallah, they won't be so resistant to prayer. But when they're not habituated to wudu and then you want them to suddenly be praying five times a day, it becomes a, this, you know, tug of war every time. Get up and pray the ah, Why? Why are we doing that? We're working against, you know, uh, our own, you know, I mean, we're working uh, counter um, to, 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 to our nature. We're lazy by nature. The nafs is very lazy. So we are lazy, excuse me. So we have to, we have to know how to go around the nafs. And that's why uh, this is important. So he says, maintaining ritual purity. And then, so these are all intentions, right? You want to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make tawbah, start to seek knowledge, maintain your wudu. Then the next thing he says is perform the obligatory prayers in the first of their time. And if it's possible in congregation, right? If you're able to do it um, in jama, if you if your family is with you, do it in jama because it's always best, right? The pray, the family that prays together stays together. These are the 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 you know words that we hear to incentivize family prayer. Very important that we do that. Um, and then to try to get it in at the very onset when it comes in. So, you know, I was gifted, may Allah bless uh, Dr. Sada, one of our wonderful community members locally. She gifted um, me with this awesome clock. Um, what is it called? Oh gosh, I forgot the name of it, but it's an Adhan clock and I love it. And I told her, I love you for this gift because the Adhan goes on every day, all five days, and it's beautiful. And then there's the, the dua right afterwards. So we're, you know, my children have learned the dua. Everything is just so, um, we're, we're able to do our prayers right away because of it. Uh, so and then clocks that are easy and affordable to get, you put them in the house. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of when does prayer come in? That's why they make them. Uh, obviously you can use your apps too for the same function, whatever is easy for you, just figure it out, but be that person who's like, oh, prayer came in. I want to do it now. I'm not going to constantly procrastinate the prayer because how many of us have missed prayers, right? You have the need to do it, but then you get engrossed into your project. You know, you got to work assignment. You got to, you got to, if you're a teacher, you're grading papers, you're reading, you're doing something, you're cooking, you go to make uh, lunch thinking I'm going to uh, be able to, you know, finish this quickly, but then guess what? Lunch uh, gets, takes two hours and then there's cleanup and then the kids have an accident and now you're cleaning up a mess and then, oh, oops, there's some package at the door and now I got to check this and we are the most distractible creatures. We're so distractible. It's part of our nature, part of the dunya. So what have you done? Because you had an opportunity at a window to pray, but your nafs, shaitan sometimes maybe, likely it's your nafs, convinced you to, to wait, you know, to do it later. Now you're in that horrible predicament where you realize it's six o'clock, the event for Asr goes off and you're like, oh my God. I didn't pray the Hari Allah, forgive me, astaghfirullah. And that guilt just eats you away. It ruins your day. That's how it should be anyway, which is a good, just to mention this because, you know, we talked about this today in, in my class with the seventh graders. When you miss a prayer, if the guilt isn't eating you, there's a problem. When you miss a prayer, there should be the immediate remorse self-loathing that comes with it if especially if it's negligence right uh, we're forgetful we're negligent whatever the case is it doesn't matter actually it shouldn't matter why you miss the prayer the fact that you missed it should still put you in a in a state of almost like a panicked state where you want to rush to do your qada you seek forgiveness from allah and you truly show remorse but there are because i know i've worked with people where shaitan can get us to the point of apathy. So you missed your prayer, you fudge your alarm clock goes off. And I've, you know, with people who are close to me, they know, you know, my positions on these things. Um, but if there's like even 
four minutes, three minutes left for Fudger and you've just woken up, you better jump out of that bed. You better run to the bathroom and make the fastest will do that you possibly can and get on that prayer mat in total uh, a sense of desperation before Allah. But for some people, the idea that you look at the clock and you're like, oh man, I got three minutes left to Fudger. I can't make will do in that time. It's okay. I'll just, oh well. And then you carry on and you start going to your social media and checking emails. This is fully like, this is not acceptable. And that is dangerous spiritually because what you're showing is, you, you know, this is a, this is why we're created. We're created to worship Allah, but you're showing, you're demonstrating a lack of remorse, a lack of guilt. Um, and there's just no accountability. There's no, and just think of it on a human level. Like if, if someone crossed you, if someone betrayed you, if someone hurt you, if someone didn't fulfill something that they were supposed to fulfill for you, it's very interesting how we are unforgiving when people do wrong, do us wrong. You know, we get mad and we are expecting some, at least some, you know, uh, mea culpa, you know, some guilt, Come to me and show me that you feel bad. Show me a, 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 an iota of remorse, of regret, of sorrow, of guilt. And maybe I'll feel better because you know what? At least you feel bad about it and I'll deal with forgiving you. But if you are, if someone hurts you and wrongs you and does all that, but then they just are carrying on, they don't have any show of remorse Trust me, none of us will accept it. We'll be, we'll flip our lid. We'll just, we'll be even more angrier. So the idea that we miss a prayer and then don't show remorse is really reprehensible. We should absolutely uh, feel the guilt right away and then seek the path of penitence, whatever we can do immediately. Offset a wrong, right? This is what the Prophet said. If you do a wrong action, offset it with the right action. Get up and do it. Even if you're late, even if it's qada, just do it and beg Allah and inshallah, you'll be fine. It's much better to do that. But in order to avoid that whole you know, scene from unfolding, when we're being in, encouraged you know, by our teachers, of course, and our great scholars, because they know, and of course, it's a sunnah of the Prophet to do the prayer at its earliest time, it's because we are circumventing the nafs. We're going around the nafs. The nafs is, is lazy, it's forgetful. So just do it, make it your you know, rule for yourself. Inshallah, you'll you'll uh, seek, you know, you'll you'll prevent um, these other scenarios from happening. Then he says, adhering to the eight rakah of the mid-morning prayer, duha, and the six rakah after the sunset prayer and before the night prayer between Asr and Maghrib performing the night prayers, right? So these are all the extra nawafila that we can do during the day also from the sunnah. And each madhab might have different formulas of when to do when, but the point is, is to be people that once you establish your five daily prayers that you now want to elevate to the next level. You know, it's interesting, right? Because life is obviously not a game, but um, you know, if you play video games, for example, it's all about getting to the next level. You don't just stay at the same level once you do really well, right? You go to the next level. So we understand it when we are in these, you know, every day-to-day -day scenarios, but in our spiritual life, we have to be reminded that, yeah, good for you. You're doing your baseline, you know, worship, alhamdulillah, but you need to seek to do more. So now that you've gotten your five daily prayers done and you're reading your Quran, you have your daily dhikr of time, you're doing all those good. Check all of them on your, you know, checklist. Now let's level up. How do you level up? You do the extra prayers. You do these extra sunnah prayers, nafila prayers. And then, you know, he mentions um yes, the so I kind of bl blended them all together, but he separates these extra uh, nafila prayers as one section, and then he mentions performing the night prayers after awaking from one's sleep. So you, again, these, this is the way that you level up. You do your, your, your fara'id, you do your sunnah, you do your nafila, and then inshallah, once you get really um, into a routine with these extra acts of worship, now it's about sacrifice, right? The hajjud, it comes from the same root as what? A mujahada, right? Or jihad, a struggle. You are struggling. Why? Because you're leaving the bed. 
It's very comfortable to sleep, uh, to be resting, warm, cold, whatever uh, you know climate you're in, to feel the comfort of your bed, um, and to just lay there dreaming all sorts of wonderful dreams, hopefully. It's very nice, and most people love sleep. A lot of people love sleep. But when you get to the level of spiritual, um, you know, the path of, as we say, there's the path of salvation, right? Our teachers remind us the path of salvation, which is basically baseline. I just want to do whatever it takes to get me to the door of Jannah to get into the Jannah. Like, let me get in. That's one path. But inshallah, we should graduate from that, that path to the path of sanctification, which is I want to be close to Allah. I don't want to just get into the door of Jannah. I want to get to the highest level of Jannah. And in order to get to the highest level of Jannah, you have to know this, the specific acts that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to do that will bring us closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tahajjud is absolutely amongst the greatest acts of worship. This, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, did it every night. Um, it was obligatory for him. Uh, you know, it was his sunnah to do it every night, but he did not make it obligatory for us. Uh, however, um, if we do it, the benefits that even just praying to rakat, there's, it's untold, there's really no way to quantify or qualify or express the, the rewards because they're, they're only known to Allah. But one thing that we know uh, is that it is a, the time for dua mustajab. So if you think about all the needs that you have, all the pain that you're carrying, all the grief that you're carrying, all the sorrow that you feel, all of these this weight on your heart and soul that you are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, uncertainty, right? A lot of people are, are, are feeling so heavy uh, spiritually because of anxiety or depression or sadness, whatever the case is, when you think and understand the power of tahajjud, tahajjud is taking all of your problems, taking all that, that burden that's on your soul and just bearing your, your soul before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking him to bring you light and to remove your burdens. That's the power of tahajjud. Um, and there's, again, so many benefits. I remember reading one scholar who said that one of the gifts of tahajjud is actually protection from illness, like, you know, uh, disease, you know, like, uh, you know, real, real serious diseases. So it actually can also help you in the physical, you know, material body, even though it's a great spiritual um, effort and act. Uh, and just, you know, to be up in that hour, that very special time of the morning where everyone else is asleep and you have that intimate time with Allah. Um, again, we can't really express but we know from, from the hadith and the descriptions that the hajjid is a very special time. And if you are a person who's dealing with a lot in your life, or you have worries about your children, you know, I spoke to a mother today who's just riddled with constant anxiety over her children. I got another message earlier, which I haven't yet responded to the same thing about a mother panicking that her daughter has a horrible, um, she's now you know, with the wrong friends group, she's smoking weed, she's doing a lot of haram that she couldn't, she can't believe that her daughter is doing these things because this was not, you know, our babies grow up and all of a sudden you're just shocked, right? How many of you who have children have had that experience? These little pure beings of light that brighten up your day that you think could never disappoint you because they're so sweet and so loving, but then they enter the adolescence uh, age, which is a very complicated age, very difficult age. And then in this day and age, especially trying to forge an identity is so difficult for our poor youth that they, they're gonna go through some, some rough patches, but you know, parents are, are dealing with this fear and this crippling sense of uh, doom and gloom that just like, oh my God, something's gonna happen. So some, some, I'm gonna get news, something that I don't wanna hear. Um, and that can really affect you. Well, if that's your reality and you're not sacrificing your sleep to, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change your circumstances, to bring you ease, to guide your children, to protect your children, to protect your family from harm, then you, there's a disconnect there because who else is going to change your condition? Who else? 
You can go to all, you can knock on every therapist door on the planet. You can go to every sheikh, sheikh, ustad, ustad, whoever. You can go to every single person on the planet for help. But if you don't knock on the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly, fervently, passionately, uh, with conviction that only he will change your circumstances, there is a disconnect there. And likely what will happen, unfortunately, is you will not see the change because you're not going to the right source. So we have to really train or retrain our brain to know the protocol of when you're in a state of desperation and panic, go to your Lord and wake up, leave the bed, set the alarm. Who cares if even if you have to go to work uh, with one eye open and cranky, you know, on coffee, it's okay if you do that periodically, because guess what, your body will adjust. And th this is also, sorry, I just have to mention this because I feel like the science, right, that has um, convinced so many people that things are fixed um, has also conditioned us to think that, oh my God, if I don't, uh, you know, drink eight glasses of water, for example, a day, or if I don't get eight to 10 hours of sleep a day, I'm going to collapse and die. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. And I think, you know, a lot of these things, there's, there, these are campaigns. These are, you know, there's, there's reasons why these things have been, you know, perpetuated or, or, or spread uh, you know, through our, through, through me, the different mediums that we've, we're exposed to, but I think we just have to look at the precedent, you know, and many of our great scholars were known to be people who were up at night, that one third of the night was for worship. And what they did is they, uh, they certainly compensated. So if they needed rest, what would they do? They would sleep during the day, the khilula, as we know, which is the nap that the Prophet ﷺ took during the midday, is something that you can certainly do, and it's a re, it's a reset. It's a power, uh, you know, nap um, that can reset you. That can really refresh you. Um, but your body can also adapt. And I, I mentioned this before, but it really is important to mention. Look into sleep training. You know, we we talk about sleep training children. You can also sleep train adults if you understand the REM cycles of sleep. Like you know, I I went into this deep research because. I really wanted to understand and alhamdulillah, I have benefited from it. One and a half hours, if you can get one and a half hours cycles of sleep, which are how we, uh, we enter the REM, that really deep, important state of sleep, you can train yourself to not rely on uh, a lot of sleep because you're getting quality sleep. So it's really more about the quality, not necessarily the quantity. But anyway, do your own independent research. Don't take my word for it. Uh, talk to your doctors, but don't be convinced that you have to, because you become a slave to sleep, then it becomes very difficult to implement this. But if you can readjust your understanding and say, you know what, Allah, first of all, is the one who gives rest and repose. So if I'm waking up to worship him and I also work full time and I have children to take care of, but I ask him to fortify me, to give me rest, to give me strength, to be able to continue to worship him uh, as best as I can and continue to manage my responsibilities, of course he'll do it. He'll give you full rest. Um, and, you know, again, I've, I've had experiences where, alhamdulillah, wa shukurillah, I've gone days, uh, you know, sometimes on very little sleep because of different, you know, objectives and things that you're trying to do. You pull those all-nighters. And then, subhanAllah, Allah will give you this incredible sleep that is so refreshing. It's like you enter a different realm. And you do, you know, the sleep is it's the little brother of death for a reason because it's a very soul experience. It's a soulful experience. And so Allah can restore you um, in ways that you just don't know. But my point is, is tahajjud is a very important part of getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you want that, if you want to feel more spiritually strong, like you just, you're, you feel like there's something missing, don't neglect the tahajjud, you know, do it. So then he says, uh, after the hajjid and, and, and encouraging, and he says specifically after waking from one's sleep. So he's trying to, you know, nudge that point a little bit uh, that you're going to have to abandon your sleep. Then he says, fulfill the witr prayer, right? Which is obviously also a sunnah um, in the Hanafi madhab. It's, it's wajib to do the witr prayer. Uh, and I'm sure it is in, in some of the others as well, but it is something that you should never abandon. Um, and then fasting, 
on Mondays and Thursdays and on the three days of the full moon. Uh, so this is an important uh, spiritual practice for those who are able to do it. You know, if you're able to fast regularly um, to do it. And I know, I, you know, I, I do a lot of intermittent fasting. I am trying to get myself to this level of being able to fast monthly. I know people who are close to me, who mashallah, they do it every week and they, you know, it's, it's just, it's a practice. So once you get good at it, it becomes second nature. It's not difficult to do. Uh, and so alhamdulillah, but even with intermittent fasting, the benefits are so incredible. Like you feel it, you feel much more clear of mind, much more lighter, everything just kind of falls into place. So a lot to say about fasting. We just finished Ramadan. So you all know it is real. It's true. And then also the days of the year in which fasting is recommended, right? So uh, we'll be inshallah for the day of Arafah, for example, um, and other days that are coming in the year that we know uh, those are always announced, you know, to, to, to fast during those times. Then he mentions reciting the Quran with the heart's presence coupled with reflection upon its meanings. So he's giving us all the ways that we can get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we're doing all of these things, right? Where, um, and I'm just gonna run down the list for those who are joining. Uh, so we repent first, you start off with Tawbah. Make Tawbah, be sincere. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you for all of your sinfulness. Then start to seek knowledge because you can't you move forward if you don't even know which direction to go to, right? So knowledge is really about you know laying out the, the, the plan ahead and following it. And then maintaining ritual purity. So ma maintaining your wudu for all the reasons we mentioned, protection from the demonic realm and, and the ability to, uh, to just be able to jump into acts of worship with ease. You attract the, the light of the angelic realm. Inshallah, the marks of our wudu will be the reason why the Prophet is able to recognize us. We can go on and on and on. Wudu literally cleanses your sins. So much to say about wudu, but maintaining ritual purity is really important. Performing the obligatory prayers in the first time. So as soon as the prayer comes in, you do it. You don't procrastinate. And if you're able to do it in congregation, also doing your sunnah prayers and whatever madhab you follow, that, that will the formulas will slightly vary. Then also doing tahajjud, which we spent some time talking about. You can go back if you just joined us, but the importance and weight of tahajjud. And then the witr prayer, fasting, all of the days that are recommended that were the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And now he gets to um, the, the point of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is what we all really need to understand. If we wanna make sense of the insanity of the world, our place in the world, how to navigate all the rapid changes that are happening and all the things that we talked about, the anxieties, the depression, the sadness, the dysfunctions, the feelings of betrayal, whatever it is you're going through, your answer is in the Quran because it's all there. You know, and this is, you know, again, our, our teachers, I mean, mashallah, if you if you followed any of the series that many of our teachers have done on the Quran, where they go into deep dive into tafsir, and they really do highlight that the stories of the prophets, right? The Quran, of course, has the best stories, but the stories of the prophets, many of them align and they reflect real human problems. So even though they were, you know, alive thousands of years ago, in many cases more, Allah knows, um, it doesn't mean that human problems have evolved to such a different degree that they're unrelatable. That's actually not true. You will see all sorts of things in the Quran, in the Quranic stories, things that we're experiencing right now today. Um, and so when you read the Quran, and as he mentions here, right, so you, first of all, reciting the Quran, you need to learn how to recite. So this is now also one of the farlain which we mentioned. Um, you know, learning tajweed is very important. You have to know how to recite the book of Allah. You can't just pick it up and apply your own um, articulation to it without studying the maharaj of the huruf, the, the way that the letters are recited or the actual rules of tajweed. It doesn't work. You have to learn and you can't learn that on your own. Tajweed requires a teacher because many of the rules need to be modeled for you. You need to, it's an oral science. You have to hear it. And then you have to repeat and replicate and, 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 um, and, and then, you know, learn, learn according to, uh, to, to how your teacher is teaching you. So learning the, the, how to recite the Quran. And then he says the qualifiers matter because, you know, the, our teachers didn't leave 
you know, they, they, they weren't ambiguous with their words. They're very specific in choice. So he's telling us to recite the Quran with the heart's presence. So you have to be paying attention with your heart. You have to really feel it. So when you read the book of Allah with your heart's presence, you know, you're, inshallah, you find, first of all, um, and I, I, this is what I would recommend. I think it's really important that you uh, recite, you know, learn how to recite, but also find a reciter whose heart, whose recitation appeals to you. Um, and mashallah, there's plenty of amazing reciters, both male and female. If you're not familiar with the Qariya app, I highly recommend that you get it. This is from uh, Sheikha Maryam Amir, who mashallah created the Qariya app. She's on there herself, but she has mashallah tabarakallah gathered reciters, female reciters from all over the world to provide you know, their voice in order to connect us with the Book of Allah. And then of course, many male popular reciters, which we know of uh, from the past as well as the present. So the point is, is find someone who when you hear them recite, the hairs on your the back of your neck or your arms are raised. That's the kind of reciter you want. You want someone who is like a punch to the heart. And Allah has given uh, his abid, his, his servants, this ability, because we've all been there. I mean, it's even been recorded non-Muslims who don't even know the words that are being said. They don't have any connection to the language. You will see plenty of YouTube pages of people hearing Quran for the first time, bawling in tears, they're moved because it is undeniably, it's the words of Allah, what do we expect? But then because uh, the words of Allah beautify the voices, right? Uh, and there's a different interpretation of how the, that particular verse in the Quran is understood. You know, do we, are we supposed to beautify our voices with the Quran or are our voices beautified by the Quran? Both cases are true. We should give our best performance when we recite the book of Allah. And of course we can't do that without a proper teacher. So he's telling us to recite with proper recitation with heart's presence. And you can do that if you connect yourself to someone who you just enjoy the recitation. When you hear them, you feel something, right? So now you're on the right track. You're, the Quran is transformed from what could be a very dry uh, subject, right? Uh, that doesn't have, that isn't really affecting your heart to something that's bringing your heart to life, right? In this way. And then you reflect upon its meanings. So now you have to have tafsir. You have to have a source, whether it's online or a book, that you can look up meanings. So it's beyond the translation even, because sometimes translations are limited, you know, there and there's plenty of them, but a tafsir is more, it gives you the back end um, of it. There's stories, like uh, for, for this class on Saturday that I was doing on Ghiba, you know, I was reading the tafsir of Surat al-Hujurat, and it's incredible. It, just the first, if you read, you know, the, 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 I think it's sort of, yeah, verse number 12 that talks about, you know, the prohibition against, uh, you know, eating the dead flesh of your brother of Riba, but just reading the tafsir and the meanings of the very first 11 verses and why they were revealed and the context, because this was a Medina and Surah, it was revealed to the uh, to the Muslims who had, you know, the Ansar and the Muhajirin who are now cohabiting, and they and a lot of the Ansar needed guidance on rules because they had embraced Islam, but they didn't. They were rough around the edges, so they needed guidance on things. For example, like not raising their voice above the Prophet ﷺ, speaking to the Prophet ﷺ with decorum, right? Um, and then even, you know, I believe there was an exchange between Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar, who they became very ruckus, you know, uh, having this uh, disputa disputation and, and, it, and it upset the Prophet ﷺ. And so there was a lot of correction that was being made. But just all of that you get reading the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat. So it gives you a much deeper appreciation for the context of the verse that now it, it's like you're almost seeing a movie come to life, right? Because when you see these conversations that are happening, um, and I'll give you an example. Let me, let me read to you because I want you to really understand the power of tafsir. So let me see if I can pull the very verses that I was reading from. Because uh, I was just amazed. I said, subhanAllah, you know, the thing is, is I my problem is I have a memory problem. So I 
I've read some of this before, but you know, it's not always to retain it. I have a hard time retaining. So when I re read something, um, it almost is like I'm reading it for the first time. Although I know I've read these things before, but here, here, this is verse number two of Surah Al-Hajrat is, oh, you who believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, nor address him in the manner that you address one another lest your deeds come to naught while you are unaware. Okay, so that's the verse, the translation of the verse. Now let's look at the tafsir. What is this? Why was this verse revealed? Right, what's the significance of this verse? This verse was reportedly revealed in response to an argument be between Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhum. Each favored a different individual for the honor of receiving a delegation from an outlying tribe. Their quarreling in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ was so loud that his voice was drowned out, at which God revealed this verse, nor address him in the, in the manner that you address one another. So imagine, and I just, I, to me, when I was reading this, I was imagining the scene. These are the two best friends of the Prophet ﷺ, and sometimes we get heated, right? So they're, they're human, and I think we forget that they're human. So they're just dis disputing over which man should receive this delegation that's coming from another tribe. And they're starting to argue, argue, and the voices are raised to the point that what? The Prophet voice is drowned out. That means he's talking. So I was imagining, I'm like, oh my God, they became so involved in this you know, heated discussion that they were actually speaking over the prophet said, who was trying to speak. So he was probably giving his advice or somehow trying to calm them down, but Allah, they didn't hear him. And so then I was like, just imagining, you know, how they must have felt when this verse was revealed and the tafsir was told to them. Can you imagine? Like you see that, so now it's like, you start to humanize these Sahaba who are of course human beings, but we tend to not have, we, we have so much formality uh, with them, which we should, but I mean to say like, we forget that they have these moments of humanity as well. And so then it says here, so nor address them in the manner that you address one another speaks primarily to new members of the Muslim polity who had taken an attitude of excessive familiarity with the Prophet ﷺ. They should not call him by name Muhammad, but by his title, messenger of God or prophet of God. So imagine some of the new Muslims who had come into the Ummah, right? This is in the Medinan period, were so relaxed with the Prophet ﷺ that they were just calling him Muhammad. Like and again, you know, this is um, it's something that you you know you want to just kind of imagine, uh, you know, at, at that time and place, it's understandable. You know, they're 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 not they don't have all this adab. They haven't been taught how to maintain adab. So the protocols they're learning through these verses, right? And then um, there's another story here as well. Oh, so look, I have number four. SubhanAllah. So ayah number four of Surah Al-Hujurat is truly those who call thee from behind the apartments, most of them understand not. So it's like, what does that mean, right? There's a story to it. Here it is. A group of Bedouin reportedly came to the Prophet while he was sleeping and shouted for him to come out from his apartment. They, they didn't know. So they're disrupting his sleep. He's asleep, subhanAllah. It's just shocking, right? They did not know in which of his wife's apartments he was sleeping. So they went behind each apartment. So not only do they disrupt his sleep, they're disrupting all of the, their wife, the wife's sleep. Ya Allah. So they went behind each apartment and called to the Prophet in a crude manner, right? One, one of them, Aqra ibn Habis, reported that he called, he had called out. So it's his report. He said, just imagine this, okay? Oh, Muhammad, verily my praise is sweet and my curse is bitter. To which the Prophet ﷺ responded, only God is like that. And then this verse was revealed. So this is the power of tafsir. It gives you the context and you're just like, wow, so this man had the audacity to speak to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that way. It's a threat. It's a veiled threat, isn't it? If I tell you that my praise is sweet, but my curse is bitter, 
that is a veiled threat. But this is the degree that these, and may Allah forgive them. We have to keep in mind, these are new Muslims. So we're not astaghfirullah, you know, casting any judgment on them. It's just the idea of this happening should be like, wow, you know, it's kind of shocking, right? That, that the Prophet was, was spoken um, like this or to, uh, to, uh, to him like this. But also look at how beautifully he responded. You know, he didn't get mad. He didn't, uh, how dare you speak to me in this way? He is exhibiting constantly beautiful character, even when he's being treated this way, when he's being mis mistreated and misspoken to in this way, he's teaching. So what did he teach them? Only God is like that. You don't have the right to speak about yourself in this way. That is God's domain, right? But this is what, when we say, when, when you know, Imam Noe is reminding us, to recite the Quran with the heart's presence, coupled with reflection upon its meanings, it's this depth. And you have to want to do it. You can't, you have to seek it. You have to see the benefit of it because, uh, you know, if you have to be, this is not, this is a matter of your own, um, you know, betterment, like, you, you, you know, your own understanding will be improved if you do this. Nobody else is benefiting from reading the Quran with depth other than you. So you have to see the, the worth of that and then seek it, inshallah. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, frequently asking uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness istighfar, or istighfar. So you read the Quran with presence, and then you also make sure that when you're doing all this, because it's normal, as we said, if you start to do all of these things on this list, and it's a very lofty list, you know, it seems like it's a tall order, but over time, it's not as difficult as it sounds. If you do it all at once, obviously, it's going to seem difficult, but you kind of have to look at this incrementally and gradually. But if you do this, you don't want to fall into a state of stagnation or which he already addressed in the foundations itself, where you start to be riddled with a spiritual disease like arrogance or just self-righteousness that can come from, uh, you know, being so, um, you know, on top of everything. Like if you're really on top of your worship, you can fall into a state of self-righteousness. So how do you prevent that or protect yourself from that? You seek forgiveness. You constantly see yourself as a sinner, as a person who's making mistakes all the time, whether they're it's act, outwardly actively doing haram or being negligent in areas that you should be better at, making, you know, we all make mistakes. So istighfar is uh, just a process that everybody be, should, should be doing regardless of their uh, their age or their experience. Maintaining prayers and blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu he mentions, uh, peace be upon him. And finally, adhering to the meritorious invocations of the morning and the evening that have come to us from the Sunnah, Adhkar al Saba al Masa. So this is, uh, you know, a nutshell, in, uh, you know, in, a, in, in the most simplest terms, you know, in a nutshell, what uh, Imam Anawi advises for those who seek to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for those again who are on uh, the Zoom call, I do have on Instagram, if you go to my second post, you will see um, how to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counsel from Imam an -Nawi. It's the second post on my feed. You'll see it. This is it that I took from this specific list and I put it together so that we can see it um, as, you know, I like visual lists. I feel like sometimes it makes it easier to follow. So feel free to use these, but this is all from this particular segment of the Foundations of the Spiritual Path, alhamdulillah. So um, let's see here. I just want to check the time. I'm sorry. Sometimes I forget where I am. Wow. I have completely lost my page. Oh, there I am. Okay. So Alhamdulillah. Now I was ambitious. I think Usada Fadwa, are you going to be upset with me? Because this next section is long. And I just realized today's our last class. It's supposed to be our last class. The next section is the council of Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. Um, I don't know if I can do this in 30 minutes, but I think we were supposed to do a, a one and a half hour class. I can read through it and try to limit my commentary. What do you think? Do, if you're here, do you think we should just jump into it and try to get through through this? And those of you who are on Instagram, do you want to go? It's up, it's up to you. If you feel like you want to take another session, of course, you're more than welcome to. Um, if you feel like you want to stop here or you want to rush through, whatever, you're in charge. 
<laughs> you're so sweet I just feel bad I keep telling all of you that we're gonna have a last class and then I realized like wow that one little section took so long um let me just see what I can do in like like maybe 10 minutes if I can get through a good chunk of this then maybe we can get to the finish line if not that I'm sorry, we're gonna have to do one more class. I hope you guys are okay with that, inshallah. But let's look at this next section. So what I just read for those of you who are on Instagram is a small excerpt from uh, Imam Anawi's al Maqasid where he advises on how to get close to Allah. And it's done, that section is finished. Now in the foundations document is another council. So we already, the entire document was the council from Sidi Ahmed Surah, but now it's more. And so it's just additional information that will help us. So let's, let's jump into this. And this is from Sheikh Hamza, he says, Finally, we add an extraordinary counsel from Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, may Allah sanctify his secret, taken from his two books, the poor man's book of assistance, Kitab al Ayana, and the principles of Tasawwuf, Qawa'id al Tasawwuf. So it is as follows, follows, excuse me. <clears throat> now this is also Sidi Ahmed Zarruq speaking. No, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you an as success. Um, no, may Allah give you an as success, rectify our worldly and otherworldly lives and grant us adherence to the way of truth in our journeys and our sojourns. That repentance, toba, is a key. Piety, taqwa, is vast, and uprightness is the source of rectification. So know these things, right? He's telling us we know we have to know toba, taqwa, and being upright, right? Uh, having uprightness and righteousness. All of these things are um, ways to, re uh, to rectify our souls. Furthermore, a servant is never free of blunders, shortcomings, or lassitude. Lassitude is like taking things way too easy, right? So we're always going to struggle with these things because we have nafus. We talked about this, right? The nafsa al-awama is inherently within all of us, this, this you know, ability to fall, right? We fall short. We do good, and then we fall short. So we struggle against ourselves for that reason. Therefore, now is the advice. Because of that, because of all these things, what we have to be watch out for. Therefore, never be neglectful of repentance. Never turn away from the act of returning to Allah. And never neglect acts that bring you closer to Allah. So we already talked about the hajjad. We talked about fasting. We talked about dhikr, salawat on the Prophet and Quran. All those things bring us proximity to Allah. So he's saying, do not avoid those things, right? I have someone asking, what document are we reading from? We're reading from Foundations of the Spiritual Path. If you go to sandala.org, go to media, you will see the document there. It's a long link. Unfortunately, I can't cut and paste it, but it is available through uh, sandala.org, sandal with an A dot O-R-G. So we are at the end of this document, but basically, again, he's mentioning don't be neglectful of repentance and don't turn away from whatever brings you closer to Allah. So all the things we mentioned, do them. Indeed, anytime you fail to do one of these three things, repent and return. If you are falling short all the time, keep coming back, keep returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not for a moment think that the door of Kaaba is closed to you because that thought emanates from Iblis. Iblis is the one who puts us in despair. Iblis is the one who comes and tells us you're a lost cause, you're broken, you're damaged, you are horrible, you're inherently evil, there's no hope for you. No matter what, you've made so many mistakes, nobody will forgive you. This is all Iblis, and because he wants us to, to he's, you know, he wants us to destroy ourselves, and so uh, the way he does that is to basically make us, fill us with hopelessness and despair, and this is why Allah uh, tells us very directly, do not despair ever in the mercy of Allah. So anytime you make a mistake, listen and obey, right? If, if you're being corrected uh, by someone who, you care, who cares about you and the nafs is intercepting, it's going to rub you the wrong way. But if what they're saying is true and truthful and you are in the wrong, just listen and obey. Just do what they're, especially if they are spiritually, you know, on the path ahead of you, take their counsel, take, and this could be your spouse, it could be your sibling, it could be your friend, it could be your parent, it could be your teacher, your coworker, but if someone Allah's placed in your life that dispenses good counsel to you and helps you, 
to see your own shortcomings. Just listen and obey because inshallah, they're teaching you the right course, right? Anytime you display shortcomings or show lack of enthusiasm, don't desist in your efforts. So don't let your nafs uh, make you feel like it always has, you always have to be on some high. This is not about that at all. We talked about that, right? Lofty uh, spiritual, you know, um, aspirations where you're looking for experiences and emotions before you've even done the work. And I've talked to people, unfortunately, they almost believe, which is again, one of those, you know, the, um, the trappings of shaitan because he, dilute, he, he distorts our understanding. So they believe that in order to pray consistently, I have to feel something to be inspired to the prayer, right? Um, and, you know, some of our uh, brothers in faith of other traditions Kind of created that I think understanding right like the, I have to feel the spirit within me <laughs> and then I can act but the spirit I have to feel it well that is not our faith and we talked about that extensively you do what you're obligated to do because you're obedient and you're dutiful and you understand that it's a command of God and he deserves to be worshipped and obeyed and that's it whether or not he fills your soul with light and you start to see the heavens open up and the angels are, are speaking to you is a gift that he may choose to give some of his creation and, or not. But that's not the motivation or the incentive to worship. You do it because you have to do it. So if, if you start to fall short or you just start not feeling as inspired as you did maybe a year ago because like you know many times for example new converts or people who've come from jahiliya you know from the darkness into the light they always reminisce about like oh when i first started praying when i first started doing this oh my gosh i was i was on such a high i love that feeling i wish i could recapture that feeling and it's like it's not if it's not that level it's not even worth doing 100% an Iblisi thought. That's just Iblis. Discouraging you from doing what you should be doing because he's set up the expectation that there has to be this high of some sort in order for it to be worthwhile. And that is just a lie. You do it because you're you're created to do that. That's it. Halas. And as I said, if Allah chooses to give you that, Alhamdulillah, if he doesn't, you still do it. Let your main concern be to remove your outward state from your outward state, anything displeasing, and then continue to work on your outward state through, con through continuous counsel. So just think of your life as a process of, you know, of basically like we are, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think of an analogy that kind of makes sense. If you see a sculptor, right, the sculptor who is really meticulous takes their time working through every little inch of the sculpture because they don't want to rush it because once it solidifies and hardens, it's over. You got to start over. So they will take their time and work while with this malleable, you know, substance, right? And we are made of clay. So there is some, some, something there that hopefully it connects, but basically that's how you have to look at it. Like you are your own sculptor. And your job or your objective should be in this earthly realm to produce the best version of you. So that's going to require you to be what? Malleable. You cannot harden. If your heart hardens, right? If, you're, if you become hard-hearted, then you, it's like the, the, the clay that has you know, gone into the oven or baked or been out in the sun and dried up. You have to start over. It's too difficult. But if you be, remain malleable, which how do you be, stay malleable in a spiritual sense? You always see yourself as a work in progress. You always welcome constructive criticism. You always are open to these things. And this is very relevant today because if you look at our culture, you know, and read the, the coddling of the American mind, read what has happened to our culture where people have become so fragile that you cannot even give them counsel anymore without people falling apart because everything is a personal attack. Everything is perceived uh, as personalized. And this is a cognitive distortion. If, if someone is giving you objective criticism on how to become a better individual, how to be better at something you do or, or enhance your performance in a certain area, 
They're objectively trying to guide you because maybe they have experience you don't, maybe they've been down the same path. But if you perceive that as some attack on your personhood, you have a cognitive distortion. Your brain is receiving information the wrong way. And if we, because we're in a culture where these things are uh, reinforced so much, right? That everybody's triggered, everybody's offended by everybody. You can't say anything without people literally thinking you're out to kill them now. It's insane. We've, we've become very, very fragile that people no longer are, are becoming better versions of themselves. They're actually regressing. Because if you don't have, Adina Nasiha, if you don't have, good counsel and good people who are looking out for you, then you become self-deluded, right? The delusions of the nefs, where you start to think you're much better than you are, that you're smarter, that you're more successful, that you're whatever it is that people, you know, put value in because you don't have the counter, uh, you know, narrative or, or, or something to counter whatever your mind is telling you. This is why, you know, it's so important to have social uh, healthy social interactions and relationships where you can get that type of feedback, right? Feedback is important. But the point here is that's how you stay what? Malleable, spiritually speaking, is you're open to advice, you're open to criticism. And if you go back, right? I mean, for those of you who are on the Zoom call, go back to the first foundation. I'm going to review this because it's all connected. We're doing a full circle here, right? Taqwa, mindfulness of Allah. That's the first foundation Sidi Ahmed Zuru calls out in private and in public. You can't be a performer. You know, this isn't about performance. This is about sincerity. So if you're if you're a muttaqi, it's going to show wherever you are, whether you're alone or with your whether you're with people. Adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. You're consistent. You say what's true and you follow it with action, right? You're not just, again, a lip service. It's not lip service. The third point is indifference to whether others accept or reject you. That's a foundation of your of the spiritual path. You have to get to the point of not being affected if people like you or not, because your moral compass, your compass, your standard is completely aligned with pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is the only one that you're concerned with. If people don't like you, oh well, as long as you're on the hook, of course, uh, and you need to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, all of it has to fall in place, which is you have to have proper guidance, you have to have good teachers, you have to have good people around you who are what revealing the reflection that you need to see the true accurate reflection and moment, you can't be around people who delude you too. But you get to this point where you're indifferent, if they not like you or not, because you're more concerned with what pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So being open to all of these things, will get you to that place of what? Going back to the sculpture, the sculptor analysis of seeing yourself as a constant work in progress. And there's always areas to refine and there's always areas to improve constantly. Like you're never done. Until you take your last breath, you should believe with 100% certainty that you will have areas and flaws that you need to correct. It doesn't matter how much you learn, how much you've memorized, how many circles of the you've sat in, how many hajj you've done, how many umrah you've done, how many fasts you've done. None of that matters because we are flawed and that's it. We'll be that way until we die. So anyway, sorry, the, the two remaining foundations, again, for those who are just joining, is contentment with Allah in times of hardship and ease and then turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So those are the, the, the what you start off with in order to build your spiritual path. And then the rest of the document goes backwards. But you know you can go and uh, contact the Rahma Foundation if you want to follow these recordings to get more. But going back to this advice of Sidi Ahmed Zuruk as far as you know being really uh, uh, focused on um, removing these blemishes from your, you know, the anything that's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then continuing to work on yourself, that's how you do it. Be open to advice and be willing to see yourself as flawed, no matter what you think of yourself. Continue doing this until you find that fleeing from anything outwardly displeasing is second nature to you and that your avoidance of the boundaries of prohibited, prohibited things is as if it has resulted from a protective net that was placed before you so that you are so cautious, right? Taqwa is really vigilance, right? It's vigilance of, of the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that's, that, that's how, you, if you do this enough, it's almost as if you're seeing this, you know, this, uh, this uh, net uh, that, that's cast uh, in order to protect you from the boundaries, right? At this point, it is time to turn inward. So once you've removed all of these outward flaws and bad habits and things that are just displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now we move to the inward, right? So he says, at this point, it is time to turn inward toward your heart's presence and to its reality with both reflection and remembrance. So the khushua that all of us seek, it can't come if you're outwardly still engaged in haram, your, uh, you know, your income is haram, you're not eating from the halal, you're um, engaging in things like gossip and mingling and free mixing and you're flirting and you're playing all these games that people play. If you're not vigilant about the boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa has put in terms of social interaction and just your, your, your presence you know, with, with his creation, then inwardly, how are you going to possibly reach that level of proximity and intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa It doesn't make sense because the inward, you know, that is sacred and it's, a, it's, it's the, the reward of all the hard work that we do to get to that level of intimacy. So sometimes, as I said, people jump the gun and they think, well, that's what I should feel first and then I'll start to follow uh, everything. Well, that's ideal, but that's not how, how faith works. Faith has to be established and then you act on it. So he says, don't hasten the end result before you have completed the beginning. Exactly. But likewise, don't begin without looking toward the end result. You know, Stephen Covey's uh, highly, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, right? Begin with the end in mind. These are all things our tradition has, but, you know, we have to follow all these new people who come with their ideas and suddenly we're impressed. No, this is it. This was, he said this how many centuries ago? Look with, you know, know the your objective. Be clear about where you want to go, um, but also don't uh, get, jump the gun, basically. This is so because the one who seeks the outset at the end loses providential security. And the one who seeks the end at the outset loses providential guidance, right? So let's look at that. This is so because the one who seeks the outset, if you want all of those rewards before, right? Um, at the end, uh, yeah, seeks the outset at the end loses providential security. So if you want these things at the outset, you're losing that, you know, security that comes from, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one who seeks the end, if you just want to get to uh, the end result at the outset, you lose providential guidance. So act in accordance with principles and the appropriate legal rulings and not in accordance with stories and fantasies. So mashallah, a lot of these things are really summarized points from the foundations because we talked about this too, right? Being in reality, not falling into fictional ideas, fictional concepts. Like we're in an age right now where people, because they do not believe in God, they don't believe in an akhirah, they don't believe in anything outside of this earthly realm. They are literally driven by their passions, by their, uh, no matter how depraved and how despicable their desires are, they're driven by them because they believe this is it. And so they get caught up in fulfilling their fantasies, their fetishes. And that's really what we're seeing unfold in front of us is a, is a world where people are catering constantly to their appetites, their emotions, because they are in the realm of this false fictional idea that we can create our own utopian realities, our own subjective truths in this world, and we can all be happy. No, you can't. It doesn't work that way because this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, this is his mulk. He owns this domain and he created it to actually be a place of difficulty and strife and pain. And that's why they're miserable people. Most of these people are miserable. You know, when you see them out there prideful and celebratory, don't fall for it. It is a lie. It's a lie. And they're, they're projecting what they want people to believe. But if you really read the, the research and follow what actually happens to many of these people, they have the highest rates of suicide, that many of them are on antidepressants, they're in therapy, they are not, because you're going against fitra, your fitra is real, Allah created you, so you're violating the laws of, uh, you know, that are established by your creator, and you're trying to be harmonized, you're never going to be harmonized, I don't care how many surgeries you get, how many partners you, you amass, 
how many people you sleep with, you will never find this utopian blissful state that you think you're going to get by giving into your desires. It is all a lie perpetuated by shaitan, adun mubin. He knows we're weak to the flesh. He knows we have uh, weak weaknesses and he exploits those weaknesses. But we have been given guidance. We have aql and the mind is very powerful if you are using it. So don't be what? pushed and uh, and uh, don't believe in, in these false stories and fantasies. Don't even consider stories of how things went with others, except as a tonic to strengthen your resolve, certainly not as a reference based upon their outward forms or what they seem to be revealing. So I gave a very general commentary on just stories, but he's specifically talking about even other people's spiritual experiences. Sometimes we seek you know, because someone had this amazing experience. And so we now also want to seek what others have, spiritually speaking. But we have to be very mindful that we're all on our own journeys to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our experiences are going to be individuated. We will not have the same experiences with prayer, with fasting, with hajj that others have. So if you hear stories, you're like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. And then you act on something because you're hoping to replicate that. You might be disappointed, but if it's your drive is just the pleasure of Allah. Like I just need to go close to my Lord and I'm not going to ca get caught up in these details and let those be the uh, catalyst for why I do what I do, right? That's why stories can be sometimes beneficial in that they can inspire, but they can also derail a person from their own path because they're too preoccupied on trying to get something, uh, simulating something that someone else had. In all of this, depend upon a clear path to which you can refer and a foundation upon which you can rely no matter what your state. That is it. I have to strengthen my um, my 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 heart because I could find myself in a situation that where I will have no helpers. There will be nobody else to call upon. So if I'm not doing this to fortify my own self, like think of for example, what was it in the 50s and 60s, or I don't remember which era in particular, but there was an era where in the United States there was a real threat of like maybe maybe it was the Cold War or or either alien invasion or something, but there was this idea of like imminent danger and people started creating bunkers, you know, like they actually built a sh shelters, right, from like nuclear war or whatever it was, because they took it so seriously, like I need to be in survival mode, I can't rely on the government, I can't rely on mom, dad, so you found a lot of people, they put the time in creating, you know, these types of safe uh, shelters or whatever, um, spaces for them and their family so that in the event something happens, they can go down, they have food, they have water, they have a place to use the restroom. They built a lot of this stuff because they were thinking of all those possibilities. Spiritually speaking, we have to kind of be in that mindset of the same survival mode. I got to be, you know, looking out for myself, spiritually speaking, because I came into this world alone and I will be, uh, you know, I will be, um, I will, I will leave this world alone. So I have to really think of, of these things on a deep level. So then he says, the best of these is the path of Ibn Allah because it gives clear direction to Allah. Do not take from others words unless it is in accordance with your own path, but submit to their implications if you desire realization. Avoid all forms of vain and foul speech to your absolute utmost. So now we're getting into other things that are also practical things that we have to be mindful of. If you speak idly, you speak like, you know, um, always, you know, self-praise, uh, you're speaking in terms that are just not becoming, that you're not in line with the prophetic character. The Prophet never did these things. He was not boastful. He was not a braggart. He was not pompous. And he also never used foul speech. You know, I um, uh, spoke to someone recently who said, you know, they knew of this uh, individual who used to be very mindful of their words. And then they moved away and they met with them again. And all of a sudden, using a lot of curse words. Why? If you, you know, what happened? Someone came around and all of a sudden now you're following the, the trends of, of, you know, the, the modern uh, era where it's just like, I want to be what popular. I want to fall into, you know, the same uh, culture as everyone else. We have lines as Muslims. So we don't use foul speech, put aside anything. If unable to discern its benefit immediately, it's good advice. Don't waste your time. If you're not sure about something, it's a great area. Why do it? Don't waste your time. 
Beware of being extremely hard on your nafs, your selfish soul, before you have obtained a mastery over it. So this is really good advice because sometimes we go way too, you know, we dive head first. We're not even thinking about like long-term effects. So when you go, you know, go big, right? Or, or you, it's like a pendulum. If you go too hard, too fast, it's something and you become, you overwhelm yourself, you can really go the opposite direction. And I've seen people do this, unfortunately, even spiritually, they try to be super Muslim overnight. It doesn't work. So be gentle with yourself and don't also punish yourself when you slip. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful of the merciful. And then uh, but also beware of being too lax with it regarding any of the sacred rulings. So you got to find that happy medium of I'm not going to push myself too hard. And I'm also not going to give myself a pat on the back or, a, you know, a carte blanche to do whatever I want to do and then make excuses when I slip. Right. I have to be willing to be count accountable to uh, Allah. And uh, muhasaba is part of that process. Right. Taking account of what you've done, what you need to do, where you felt fallen short and then fixing things. This is so because it is constantly fleeing from moderation in everything, and it inclines towards extremism in both matters of deviance and guidance. Very important point. The nafs does not like balance. The nafs loves extremes. So don't, whenever you're going extreme in either direction, know that it's taken the wheel, as they say. You got to bring it back to the aql. The mind has to be, this is a rational process, right? We are rational human beings. But if your nafs, your appetites, your emotions are dictating, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Seek out a companion to help you out in your affair and take his counsel concerning matters that occur from both your inward states and your outward affairs. So try to find people who match where you are, you know, and that, um, you know, who are, who are, um, who have a similar, you know, uh, you're, they're on the path with you because sometimes people are on very different, you know, wavelengths, they're on different levels and it can become difficult to uh, feel like you really have a companion that's on the path with you. But if you're somewhat at least aligned, it'll be much easier and you can benefit each other with good counsel, support and all of that, right? Um, and then if you do indeed take his companionship, then treat him in a manner commensurate with his state and give him of yourself based upon his inabilities and abilities because the perfected companion can no longer be found. So yeah, don't be too um, hard on, on, you know, or don't uh, have too many high expectations from even your companions, just kind of, uh, and I think this is a wise advice too in general about like, for example, you know, some people become very codependent in their relationships. They start to rely too much on one another. They get disappointed easily. Then they personalize things as we talked about. This is not good. We need to have a very safe, healthy distance in all relationships, even between husband and wife, even to, between parent and child, there should be a healthy distance. And that's going to look different based on the relationship. But we really do have to see ourselves as being truly, spiritually speaking, on a path alone to God. And there are others that Allah has gifted us with on the journey, but our path is really our own, right? And so having some safe distance will help with that. Then he says, furthermore, um, sorry, indeed, in these times, even a suitable companion who is agreeable rarely lasts. So that's just, you know, uh, real talk about the nature of dunya, right? Furthermore, beware of the majority of people concerning both your religious and worldly affairs, unless you have ascertained they have a sound relationship with their Lord, rooted in knowledge, which is free of caprice and love of leadership, and they are in position, possession of sound intellect, free of the pitfalls of hidden agendas. So basically, don't get too close with people unless you vetted them, unless you can see true prophetic character or desire of, of wanting the same things, spiritually speaking, that you do. Don't uh, let them in your heart. Your heart is, you have to protect it like a fortress. You know, imagine it's, you're in a fort and you're a fortress and you have a moat and there's a drawbridge. Anybody who wants to get close to you has to go through a lot before you suddenly trust them with your secrets. You see people telling people their business. What are you doing? We live in the age where people can weaponize information. So be smart, be wise. Do not tell people your business um, and be cautious because not everybody has good intentions. And if they, if they're worthy uh, of your love and trust and loyalty and fidelity, Allah will show them to you. You will have that and time will tell. And I truly believe in that. Um, and then he says, do not be heedless of the machinations of others or their hidden states. There you go. Consider these two from both their origins and their actions. 
People of high character and family distinction are almost always beneficial. On the other hand, excruciating circumstances compel a person of low character and origin to forsake others in need. So he's making excuses that yes, it's always better to have people who come from good family backgrounds where they had this moral right upbringing um, and, and that would be ideal. But we also have to excuse that those who have not had those circumstances, they're compelled by uh, other things, right? It's not necessarily, uh, th there's a sense of you know survival and maybe because they have had to fend for themselves, they haven't felt support, that they may forsake people easily, but it's not necessarily always malintent or other reasons. So it's you know just a nice balanced way of looking at different groups of people that you may encounter in life. Be extremely vigilant of the dominant qualities of a given people in any given land and don't be heedless of the divine wisdom in the creation notice gathering and separation so this is actually really wise too in terms of just becoming emotionally intelligent part of emotional intelligence is being able to read the room understand the nuances of different groups and individuals you know that come together based on culture based on background upbringing all the things we talked about if you're a person with strong social skills you will take the time to learn about people to learn about what are the predominant qualities of their culture or their background what things that really distinguish them from others and this is why the Quran Allah subhanahu wa tells us in surah al-hujurat right that I've created you into nations and tribes that you may come to know one another. We have to be doing the knowing part. And so this is where really taking the time to pay attention and, and, and seeing those different changes and then treating people according to their specific uh, way and culture. Some cultures, for example, are very particular about um, let's just say like gender mixing, okay? There's some cultures where you have a little bit more flexibility and they're not as rigid. Other cultures, they're very particular about, you know, men and women, for example, speaking, even if it's in a halal, um, you know, environment, if you go to a person's home who has a particular, who's raised in a certain culture where there was more separation, um, even if everybody's nice and there's families and it's a very beautiful, safe, mahram are everywhere, everybody's observing hijab, some people will have much more strict rules around commingling than others. Other people are more relaxed, you know, so you might meet someone whose spouse is very, um, you know, uh, talkative and, and just very sanguine, you know, in their nature, and they're, they just like to keep conversation going. If, if that person meet someone whose uh, husband, for example, does not like that, um, then they should have, you know, not personalize it. Like, what's up with that guy? Why is he so uptight? I didn't mean anything by asking his wife how he is. No, maybe that's his culture. And you should just be respectful that he comes from a different background than you do. And he's not used to random men coming and making small talk with his wife, you know? So these are the kinds of sensitivities that we learn when we are paying attention. Some of this, now I'm going back to the reading, some of this we've already covered in the book Al-Qawaid, so study the subject further there. Organize your hours in a manner appropriate to each time's specific needs, using a gentle and tolerant approach, all the while being very wary of the extremes of rigidity and laxity. So now he's giving us counsel on how to organize our time. We need it. Every one of us needs time management. With laxity, this is especially necessary given that too much latitude in permitted matters sets the heart back on its journey to such a degree that even a man of resolve ends up looking like a foolish child. So if you start to allow yourself too much, there's a lot of permission, you know, permission to listen to music, to watch TV, to start eating, you know, randomly and not really caring for yourself in the right way, then you may end up regressing. And that's really what he's trying to say. So find the balance of remembering your nafs, you have to master it. And it is like this strong-willed, disobedient, rebellious child that knows how to manipulate you. So don't be manipulated, right? Know that you have to govern the nafs. And then he says, work for this world as if you will live forever, but work for your next life as if tomorrow you die. In other words, do not neglect the externals of your worldly needs, all the while keeping in mind your end and final resting place. Be extremely vigilant with about avoiding positions of leadership. This is so important. If you want to be a leader in anything, check yourself. That desire for leadership, the desire for power is being overshadowed or is overshadowing the responsibility that comes with it because you're seeking something, right? You're seeking 
power or reputation. Suma and uh, Ria are diseases of the heart. Wanting people to hear of your accomplishments, wanting people to know that, oh, you got this position, you won this uh, whatever role or whatever it was, you went and finished your degree and now you have been offered this blah, 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 whatever it is. If you like people to know these things about you and then you seek out those opportunities and you really believe that you are the best qualified person for the job, I would say take a moment and rectify yourself a little bit because you're forgetting that any role of responsibility comes with immense, immense pressure. I was actually speaking to uh, someone uh, just yesterday and actually, yeah, well, she was she's a, a principal of a local Islamic school. I was speaking to her yesterday and I just told her I could never do what she does because I know the weight uh, that they carry. They're responsible for children. They're responsible for parents and teachers and community. It is a lot uh, of work to be in community service, especially those who are in the field of education and have the top role of any uh, school, right? It's very, very difficult. So the point is, is not to seek those things out. If people appoint you, if they beg you and plead and hold, you know, try to twist your arm, inshallah khair, because now this is a sign from Allah, inshallah, maybe that you are being called to that point of duty, but not something that should come from you. Um, and then he says, so I'm sorry, be extremely vigilant about avoiding positions of leadership, but you sh should you be tried with such matters, know your own limitations. So look how he phrases it. If you're tried and tested with the role of leadership, like Allah puts you in that, it's a test. So know your limitations, know that he will hold you to account. Be absolutely sincere to Allah with the sincerity of one who knows full well the one who is placing demands upon him. So when you are in that leadership role, role, know that the one who has put you in that role also has demands of you, right? Surrender completely to his decree with the submission of one who knows he can never overcome him. We will never overcome what Allah has planned for us. Never. We will never, if Allah wishes something for us, we can try to thwart it every which way possible, bring all of humanity together to try to concoct some plan. He has his plan. We have our plans. He's the best of planners. We'll never be able to overcome anything he wills for us. Know that and then stay in your lane. Humble yourself. Stay, be disobedient. Inshallah, Allah will give you tawfiq. Have a firm foundation in all of your affairs and you will be safe from their pitfalls. Organize your devotional practices and you will find your time is extended due to the grace that pervades it. Allahu Akbar. If you spend time organizing your uh, worship with what Allah pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will put barakah in your time. He will, time dilation is real. It is a very real phenomenon that happens. Ramadan is a perfect proof of that. And there are other people who've experienced this in very real ways. They have gone to either the sacred cities of Mecca and Medina or other places on these spiritual uh, you know, expeditions or, or trips. And they have seen and witnessed the time being stretched for them. They've been able to accomplish things that they could never accomplish in regular normal circumstances. Time dilation is real and it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the one who prioritizes him. Right when we prioritize Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, then He will give us ease and 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 that uh, dilation of time so that we can get other things done, Inshallah. And that's what I was saying about Hajjat. If you give up your bed for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you think He's going to leave you to suffer? Not when you do it with full trust that He will take care of me. If I need rest, He'll give me rest. If I miss something, He'll help me. I have to have that trust that I'm in the best hands when I do anything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never let my mind convince me otherwise because those are always ways to deter us from good, right? Never be fanatical about anything, whether it is true or the truth or not, and your heart will remain in a state of soundness towards others. So if you're not a fanatic, if you're a person of balance, right, you don't go to extremes, we talked about that, then other people will also gravitate towards you. Never claim anything to which you are entitled, not to mention that to which you are not entitled and you will be safe from connivance and treachery. Uh, just, uh, I just want to mention this because I watched this video of Sheikh Hamza. He was telling the story of Sayyidina Abu Bakr when a man came to him. It was in a video I saw yesterday, but he, I, I was reminded of the story. It's a famous story of when a man came and he was cursing at Sayyidina Abu Bakr and accusing him of the most heinous things, horrible things. And the Prophet stood there smiling and Abu Bakr was silent. And then 
Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, then he spoke up and he started to defend himself. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left. And then later he asked the Prophet said, what happened? You were there smiling and then you left. And now the Prophet is teaching him. And he said, what? When, I, when the man was saying all those terrible things about you, I saw the angels defending you. But the moment you went into defense of yourself, Iblis came into the picture. And I don't stay in the room with Iblis. Or I don't, you know, I'm, I don't share the same space with Iblis. So this power of the story, you know, and I don't have the, the rest, like the full context of what happened next, or that was just the story that Sheikh Hamza said. But I think more importantly is what the Prophet was is trying to convey for us, right? Which is people will violate your rights in this way. This man was accusing Sayyid Abu Bakr, who, come on, everybody who knows him, who knows who he is, you know, he is the most beloved companion to the Prophet so It's without a doubt his character. There's no dispute about who he is. So whatever this man was saying, it's obviously false. There was no need for him to defend himself, but it's an example for all of us that we will experience these things where people will take our rights from us. They will, um, you know, do these things, violate our trust. And yes, we have the right, we have recourse by Sharia to go through different ways in order to protect ourselves. But sometimes in this case, like you have to weigh every situation. Uh, the Prophet is teaching him, you didn't need to defend yourself. The angels were doing it for you. So in this same vein, Never claim anything to which you are entitled, right? If, if someone is taking something that you have, you want your rights, just let it go if you're able to. And everybody's different. And I'm just giving you general advice. So don't take this as a letter, it's, uh, you know, like something that is in concrete uh, that you have to follow. But it's more like assess the situation. As they say, pick your battles. And if you can forego uh, something for the greater good, or even if you're entitled to something and you want it, just you know, khair, inshallah. Allah is a witness and he will compensate for whatever it was. I don't need to make a big deal out of every single situation, right? Um, and then indeed, anyone claiming a rank above his own will fall, scandalized and humiliated. Allah may Allah protect us from ever thinking we're better than we are and always keep us humble to know, to see our flaws before any good and to recognize that our good is always from Allah anyway, and he can take it away at any time. Moreover, those who claim a rank they warrant will have it stripped from them. So we don't make claims. Don't make claims. Just let things be and speak always humbly. Conversely, those who claim a lesser rank than their own will be elevated to an even higher one than they deserve. So when you see the people of other, the people of akhlaq, the people of true prophetic comportment, they always deem themselves less than what they are. They're not ones that are showboats and braggarts and try to, uh, oh, I'm, in, I'm entitled to this. Or, I deserve this. I worked hard for this. I'm more knowledgeable. I know, astaghfirullah. They just leave it to Allah and they never feel the need to ever uh, self-promote or advocate. It's just not the way of people of Allah. Allah will take care of them and they truly believe that. Never reveal to your companion anything of your state other than what his own state warrants. The reason is that if you go down to his level, he'll have contempt for you. Whereas if you attempt to raise him up to your level, he'll forsake you. So this is really just about keeping a very balanced, healthy um, and distance, even, you know, just with what we share with, with our companions, because human nature, it's true, you know, there, there are relationships that are tested in this way, there's relationships that outwardly look like they're strong, but there is internally hasad and other things that are happening. So you just want to be very careful not to uh, get ahead and, and to give too much trust to anybody, really, especially in this day and age. And then never demand a right from anyone, whether an intimate or a stranger. The reason is simple. A stranger owes you nothing. And one close to you is too important to direct your blame toward. Never assume that anyone in this world can really understand your circumstances other than from the perspective of his own circumstances. Because in reality, people see things only in accordance with their frames or of reference and their personal path. I mean, I just love how genius. Sidi Ahmed Zaruf is a true, you want to talk about psychology. You want to talk about interpersonal, like real, like the dimensions of, of human the mind and, and all these things, our scholars had all of it. What you're seeing now, I really believe a lot of them copy and they just go back and, and try to repackage what they're reading. But this is such incredible insight, right? It's true. If you're constantly seeking human validation, thinking that you're going to meet someone who really understands you, you're going to be disappointed every time because nobody understands you. Nobody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who sees you in your totality, in your entirety. And so 
people will try because we're empathic. We, we want to reach out. We want to connect. We want to be able to see, you know, to show you that validation, but we'll always fall short because we're not able to see things holistically. And so, and as he said, our vantage point is based on what we, you know, we see, I'm on this side of the situation, you're on that side of the situation. I can, we're likely not looking at things from the exact perspective. I might see some things that you see, but I don't see it exactly the way you see it. So lower your expectation. And I would say this, especially for married couples, because I think a lot of people, um, and I'll speak to my sisters here. I think a lot of sisters, we forget that as much as we want our husbands to sympathize with us, to understand us, to really have our backs, to be able to, you know, listen to us with a sympathetic ear and give us, you know, the right understanding and perspective. It hurts a lot when we put them, when we set them up to fail, because at the end of the day, gender differences are real. Men and women are, um, you know, we create, I mean, we, we see things differently, right? We, we do, we, we do. And our perspectives are, and one necessarily isn't better than the other. It's just a matter of what is, you know, um, what is what is being asked of the individual. So if you need empathy and you want validation, I always advise wives to look more towards female companionship for that, um, because you will likely put your husband in a difficult spot if you're thinking that he's going to be able to emotionally uh, heal you in the same way that maybe another woman who totally relates to your challenges, whether it's with children or with your in-laws or with other things, external things that are affecting you. Another woman is probably is most likely going to better you know, understand you than your spouse, even though the expectation is my spouse should because they live with me, they love me, they claim to love me. Why can't they get it? Why don't they ever see things the way I want them to see it? Well, there's a lot of reasons why, but lower the expectation a little bit, You know, bring it down to a human level. And just to heed this warning that um, again, never assume that anyone, I mean, his words are very clear. Never assume that anyone in this world can really understand your circumstances other than from the perspective of his or her own circumstances, because in reality, people see things only in accordance with their frames of reference and their personal path. We do a lot of uh, projection. We do a lot of, you know, um, insertion of our own opinions and personalities and temperaments and all the things that make us individual. So it's hard, right, to assess things the same way as another person, unless you're very empathic but it's rare to meet people like that. However, when aims, purposes, and aspirations are similar, people tend to work together toward a common goal. So that's, yes, we can find commonality when things align, but again, it's not always easy. Never belittle any talk that concerns absent people, even if there is no harm in it due to the likelihood of harm entering into it. This is important. We talked about this on Saturday in the class that I was referencing earlier on Riba, Bahta, and Namima, that bringing up the people when they're not there is dangerous and you should avoid it because it opens the door for harm because, you know, Sheikh Hamza used to say one of the most dangerous questions you can ask people today and nowadays is how so-and-so, because you're just asking a general question, like, how is this person? But it usually opens the floodgates for riba. Like, oh, let me tell you, you know, did you hear they got divorced and then this happened and this happened? So the be better advice is to avoid bringing up people in their absence. Guard your secrets, even if you feel safe with someone, because the one to whom you divulge your secret to is not a safer vessel than your own heart before you revealed it. B mind blowing wisdom, mind blowing. And I'm very big on this. Please, 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 please don't tell people your sins. Don't tell people your sinfulness. Don't share it ever. Don't think, oh, I can confide in this person. They can, you know, um, they're my vault. I'm just going to tell them all my secrets. And no, because as he points out, which is very wise, subhanAllah, that the person that you divulged it to or are going to divulge it to is not safer than your own heart which came which it came out of right you're 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 supposed to guard your secrets and you can't even guard your secrets because that's why you're telling someone else so how do you expect them to keep your secrets and i have seen lives destroyed by this by the way i will be laugh from people who are evil enough to weaponize 
things shared with them in confidence, but there are people who do it. They will take things you've shared with them and they will turn around, blackmail you, hold it over your head, ruin your existence because you, you gave them information. And so we just have to be very careful not to do that. And then we're almost towards the end here, you guys. Uh, forgive me, I'm trying to get through this, but I want to be true to my statement of last class. Never leave an Adam's weight of your regular devotional practice. Never be lenient with yourself in either relaxed times or those of high resolve. Indeed, should you miss some of your practice at a given time, redress it later. If you are not able to do your usual practice, at least occupy yourself with some other similar practice. So if you can't pray, ladies, when you're on your menstrual cycle, do something, right? Do something to compensate for what you're not doing. Read more Quran, read more Hadith, memorize a text, watch talks, um, learn, you know, pursue knowledge, but don't be like, oh, vacation. That's a really horrible framing if you think about it. What are you vacationing from? You usually vacation from something that you don't want to do regularly, work, right? School, things that you see as chores. Worship should never be framed that way. Worship should be, it is what gives your soul life. It's, it's a blessing to be guided and it's a blessing to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to frame it that way is dangerous, but the way that you kind of, again, bring that balance is to say, okay, I'm not praying because I'm menstruating. I'm going to do this instead or whatever it is. If you're traveling, you're doing something where you're off your routine, you find other ways to compensate. If you aren't, um, never obey your selfish soul, even for a moment, nor believe any of its claims, no matter what it says. Nafs is the greatest enemy of the human being. There's four of them. Dunya, Hawa, Shaitan, Nafs. Nothing is worse than Nafs. Do not obey your Nafs. Go against your Nafs. And I'll, I've given this example before, but one of the things that you'll, if, if it's happened to you, I have been in this predicament many times where I have to go somewhere and then I, I'm praying. So I pray the Lord but I'm on my way to go somewhere. Cause you know, you make your wudu, you get ready. And then I usually say, I'm going to pray my dhuhr right before I go. So sometimes, and this is the, just to show you an example of the power of nafs. I'm praying and you know, there's sunnahs to prayer. The dhuhr has four before if you want, or, or for the Hanafis and then two after. So sometimes, you know, I, I jump into the prayer and then there's this dialogue that happens almost all, every time I'm in this situation where it's like, you know what, you're going to be late. You just get up and go, right? Just, you know, it's okay. You can do your duas, your tasbih in the car. So there's always this kind of negotiation, right? And I, it's funny. It's not comical to me because I recognize it as nafs, right? That the nafs will still do this to me. And alhamdulillah, I got to, I've gotten to a point where I don't care. It can, I can have these ideas whatever they are, but I will absolutely immediately after I turn my salams and I say my prayer, I shoot myself right up and I enter my prayer for my sunnah. Why? Because there's no discussion. Um, I know the thoughts are coming. I can't control my mind. It's a please because I really like to be punctual. I don't like to be late to things. So that's where it comes from, right? This desire to be punctual. He's exploiting that. He's, um, I mean, not he, I guess she, my nafs. She is, um, She's telling me all these ideas, trying to freak me out about being late, but you have to get so in tune with yourself to know like, oh my God, here's the same lame strategy you use every time. I don't fall for it. And the way that I shut you down is I immediately disobey everything you're saying and I shoot right up. I do my prayer and guess what? Alhamdulillah, I'm not late. I have peace of mind. And I actually feel quite satisfied when I come out of my sunnah prayer, feeling like Alhamdulillah, I dominated. Again, alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah, for tawfiq. Thank you for giving me the presence of mind to know my nafs is trying to derail me, thwart me from receiving the, the blessing, added blessing of doing my sunnah by convincing me with all these ridiculous arguments where it's irrational thoughts. Alhamdulillah, this is how you do it. So when we say never obey your selfish soul for even a moment, that's what we're talking about. That level of awareness that the nafs will always try to take away opportunities of khair for you, right? Don't obey it, go against it. And that's the way you do it. Do, disobey it, do exactly what it's telling you not to do. To the utmost guard your resolve in all affairs. And should you resolve to do something, do it immediately before it abates or dissipates. We talked about that. Don't procrastinate. Procrastination is one of the spiritual diseases that can really afflict people, but be a person of action and, uh, and resolve. Examine your soul constantly in matters you're obliged to do or those that you should do. Always do this muhasaba, this examination. It's very important. Leave off anything you don't need to do, even the recommended. In short, do not involve yourself 
in anything other than the absolute necessary or that in which a real discernible need exists. So this is where, you know, learning what is fard, what is wajib, what is, uh, you know, um, what is mandub, what is makru, what is haram, you have to know the, the different levels of actions and then do you know extra things as they uh, appear, but be more uh, vigilant on what is you know uh, demanded of you. What are your fardhain? Treat others just as you would want to be treated and fulfill what is due. All of this is epitomized in the words of the poet when he said, "If you desire to live such that your religion is safe and your portion." is full and your honor is sound. Guard your tongue, never mention another's faults for you too have faults and others too have tongues. Take care of the eye when it reveals another's faults saying, oh my eyes, remember the eyes of others. Live treating well all others and avoid aggression and should they oppress, repel it, but with kindness. The source of these words is, in fact, the traditions of the Prophet when he said, be vigilant of Allah wherever you are and follow a misdeed with a good deed and it will remove it and treat others with the most excellence of character. In another, he, he said, every child of Adam makes mistakes and the best of you, excuse me, the best of those who make mistakes are those who seek to redress them. He also said, the Holy Spirit inspired my heart's core that no soul will die until it fulfills its decreed portion of this world and its appointed time here. So be conscious of Allah and make your request with dignity. So that's just important. We all have a uh, you know, number of days here in this earthly realm and just uh, you know, to make the most of it. In summation, and we're almost at the end here, in summation, repentance, awareness of Allah and uprightness are the foundations of all benefits. The truth is manifest and its details are weighty and significant. The affair belongs to Allah. Success is in his hands. Peace. And then from Al-Qawaid briefly. Oh, wow. SubhanAllah. There's even more. I thought I was done. <laughs> are you ready to go? Are you just done with me right now? Ya Rabbi. I'm here. I'm here for as long as you need me to be here. I love you. You're so sweet. I just want to finish this. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me. I'm going to be a super speed reader right now. We're going to just get through the text. I'm not even going to comment. <laughs> I'm just going to read it. I've done so much commentary. Unless I really have to, okay? I'll just give myself that ability. If I have to, I'll comment. This is from Al-Qawaid. Our Sheikh Abu, Al Abu Abbas Al-Hadrami said, Spiritual training was elevated to a science due to the development of a, tech, of a technical vocabulary, but benefit from it is derived only as a result of aspiration and spiritual states. So adhere to the book and the prophetic practice without omitting or adding anything. This applies to all of your transactions with your creator, the creation, and yourself. As for what is between you and God, three matters are concerned. Fulfilling obligations, avoiding prohibitions, and submitting completely to his decree. As for dealing with the self, so I'm sorry, let me review that. Fulfill your fara'id, your fard. Stay away from the haram and then be in submission. That's it. These are what we are, uh, uh, what we, we should give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for dealing with the self, this also involves three necessities. An unbiased approach to the truth. As we said, I want the truth no matter where it comes from, who it comes from, right? Abandoning defense mechanisms such as self-justification, and guarding against the dangers of the self in respect to its attractions and aversions, its acceptances and rejections, and its comings and goings. We have to do more study on the nature of the nafs, what it pulls us to, the distractions and all the distractibility, all of those things in order to know how to avoid it. But self-justification is a huge part of also gaining mastery over the nafs. As for dealing with people, this concern three this concerns three requirements also, ensuring their rights are fulfilled. Give rights to people, a virtuous lack of desire for their possessions. Don't be a hasud, a person who is, you know, wants uh, the, what other people have. And absolute avoidance of anything that adversely affects their hearts unless it concerns an obligation to the truth that cannot be ignored. So one of our dear friends, uh, Dr. Ozma, she uh, always used to tell me that her grandmother taught her never break anyone's heart. No matter what you do in this life, be a person who that is your mantra, your rule. You will never break anybody's heart. And I think it's beautiful, simple advice. You could teach children, you can teach anybody. Just don't do it. Don't hurt people. That's it. Any aspirant of this path who inclines toward the feeling, toward the following preoccupations will perish. Okay. Um, Horseback riding, 
general self-interest occupation with changing social wrongs or with fighting in military jihads while neglecting the acquisition of personal merit and virtue, believing that he is in no need of rectifying his soul or that he can obtain all the virtues. So yes, this is basically hobbies, right? Getting into really fun stuff that you like, self-interest um, and, and engaging in things that are socially unacceptable because you're uh, and because basically you're not really rectifying your own self you're just too preoccupied you're too distracted by all these other ventures other interests that to work on yourself so that's why he, they're mentioning these things right that if you do this you'll perish and then he says seeking out the faults of his brothers and others so if you're a fault seeker you're looking for flaws in other people you'll perish excusing himself by claiming abandonment of the world so if you're like this oh i'm this ascetic and i'm just gonna you know I, i'm giving up the dunya and you go to this extreme where you are foregoing the rights that others have over you in order to uh, you know fulfill your own whatever spiritual desires but you're not fulfilling him according to uh, the prophetic path which is balance right the prophet um he he was a father he was a husband he fulfilled his obligations he didn't just go off into the mountains so you can't be like oh i'm just going to give up the world and then you know forget uh, that you have uh, obligations and responsibilities spending all of his time in religious devotion again this is a lack of balance if you're and i know people who've done this they would let their families completely fall apart while they're off because they have to be in the masjid at a certain time or the sheikh is coming so and so is coming and they have to attend these things while their children are falling apart home is falling apart so that's just total delusion of the nafs right we have uh, we have people have rights over us and if we're not fulfilling those rights then for us to seek um, Allah, it's just, a, again, a total disconnect that way. You have to be doing things in the right order. Um, spending a good deal of time in public gatherings or seeking company, not for teaching or learning, but simply for human companionship. So we have to be clear. Allah knows our intentions. If you're going to the kids, you're going to classes because you want to socialize, you're not there to learn. It'll be very clear to you um, because you won't have tawfiq and Allah will call you into account for misrepresenting yourself, you know, as a student of knowledge when you're not even really there for the right intentions. Inclining toward the people of wealth, claiming he is doing so for religious reasons, preoccupying himself with spiritual matters of the heart before learning the basis of sound transactions or the rectification for his, of his faults. All of these are things, again, showing imbalance, lack of prioritization, lack of truly understanding the correct order of what you should be doing as a believer. Thrusting himself forth as a spiritual teacher without being appointed by a true spiritual master, scholar, or imam. So if you're out there positing as a leader, a teacher, an influencer, and nobody has endorsed you, nobody of sound, sound reputation has endorsed you, you are a liar, you're misleading people, you're a charlatan, you're likely misguiding people because... If you had a proper teacher, then they would either endorse you openly or at least give you the credentials to do so. But in the absence of those things, for you to be positing as one is very dangerous. Um, mindlessly following anyone who says, follow me, whether his words to be true or false. So basically being a sheep without ascertaining the details of his state, belittling someone who is among the people of Allah, even if he should deem that person insincere based upon some proof he has. So basically, you know, judging people, dismissing people, showing, you know, that you think you know better or you know someone just because maybe the one little thing that they did or didn't do that rubbed you the wrong way, now you're just going to throw them out and speak ill of them. These are all reprehensible, poor, qual uh, you know, character flaws that a person of God does not possess. And if they possess them, they certainly don't show them outwardly. They try to work on removing them. Um, yeah, well, inclining toward dispensations and interpretations. So if you're always looking for shortcuts, you want rukhsas for every little thing, it's likely because you're looking to make things too easy on yourself and you're not really working on disciplining the soul. Putting the inward before the outward. Uh, yeah, like if you're, you know, because there are people who are all about spirituality, right? New age spirituality. I'm spiritual and spiritual. I do a lot of things spiritually, but outwardly they're engaged in every fiscal and facade. What? There has to be, you know, a, that can't be so disconnected, disjointed. Um, being satisfied with the outward to the detriment of the inward, extracting from what from one that what contradicts the other, being content with knowledge devoid of action or with action devoid of an inward state or knowledge, believing that an inward state suffices without the other two. So all of that kind of is, 
similar to what I just said, or having no principle to which he has recourse in his actions, knowledge, states, or religious practices from the accepted principles in the books of the imams, such as the books of Ibn Abba'illah concerning inward matters, especially at Tanweer. So this is his recommendation. And concerning outward matters, the book of Ibn al-Hajj, Madkhal, and those of his Sheikh Ibn al-Jamra, as well as of others who follow the same path from among the realized masters. So these are all the, uh, the uh, recommendations of how to, again, have the proper understanding. May Allah have mercy on all of them. Any aspirant, any person who's really a seeker, who is of the above mentioned types is in fact ruined and has no salvation on this path. But whoever holds to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophetic practice will be safe and Godspeed arrive. Protection is from him alone and success is by him. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was once asked about Allah's words, tend to your own souls. And he replied, if you see covetousness obeyed, passions and whims followed, and every opinionated person marveling at his opinion, own opinions, then tend to your own soul. This is the day and age we live in. Look at social media. We're seeing all of this. People are completely driven by passions, whims. They're, uh, it's all envy and coveting. And then a lot of self-promotion. And, you know, I'm so, I have so many wonderful things to say. Let me advise you on everything in life. Then what should we do? Tend to our own soul. He, may Allah grant him peace and blessings, also said something to this effect. In the tablets of Ibrahim, Suhaf uh, Ibrahim, uh, alayhi salam, it is written, an intelligent person should know the age in which he lives. He should hold his tongue and mind his own business. An intelligent person should have four portions of his day for the following. A portion to take his soul to account. A portion to converse with his Lord. A portion to spend time with his brothers, meaning those who help him to see clearly his faults and direct him to his Lord and a portion to indulge in his own personal recreation from the permissible appetites of man. Incredible wisdom. Just imagine if we lived by that, every person. We had this simple formula, four portions of your day, 24 hour period, you do the math, six hours, right? <laughs> Mathematician, Fatima, mashallah. So that's it, you know, divide your, your time. May Allah provide us with that and help us to fulfill it. May he always maintain us in a state of grace for we cannot survive without his bestowal of grace and prosperity. Allah is enough for us, alhamdulillah. And God is the best of protectors. May prayers and peace be upon our master Muhammad and his family and his companions. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, we have gotten to the end of the text. Allahu Akbar. Thank you, Asada Fadwa, for your patience with me. Thank you to all of you on Instagram and those on Zoom who are tuned in. We did it. I'm very happy. I know it took much longer than I intended, but inshallah, we did it. If there are any questions, I think I can stay. If Asada Fadwa, you have to go. I totally understand. I actually, we still have time, alhamdulillah. It's only 7.15, so we have time for Asad. But um I'm happy to take questions because this is the final session and I did want to leave some time for Q&A. So let me see if there is anything. Ustad Father, do you have anything? I, I know I got tech, I got questions here on Instagram, so I got to go all the way back. Yes, yeah, go, uh, go ahead and take the questions from Instagram. We don't have any questions here. Okay, alhamdulillah. Let me see here. May all the current Seek refuge in the law. I mean, so sisters are making dua here. Okay, so people are asking about the text. Okay, let me see. I'm so sorry, guys, because this is very difficult for me to do, which um, with on, on my iPad. My iPad is turned sideways. My keyboard is like parallel or perpendicular to the iPad. I cannot, I can't type the link in here. That's why I can't do it. But if someone can please... I will share the link. I will share the link on Instagram. Okay. Thank you. So Ustad Fatwa is going to share the link for this document. It's called The Foundations of the Spiritual Path by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. It is an incredible text. Please take time. I, I get you came in. If you're listening to for the first time, you're coming in to the tail, the end of it. We, we literally finished it today, right now in this moment. But it is such an incredible, rich text that everybody can benefit from it. So please take your time to read through it. There's a lot of great advice. So this is one of the questions that I have here on Instagram. How can I counsel my sister who got diagnosed with an autoimmune condition that is a degenerative condition, lifelong? She's not able to accept it. I don't know how to help her. Yeah, Allah, first and foremost, Allah, may Allah grant her shifa. 
um, it's very difficult when your loved ones are tested with their health because they, they're hurting, they're in discomfort, they're in pain and you feel helpless. Um, but we believe that Allah tests everybody differently and health uh, you know, tests are certainly real. And if a person bears those tests with patience and with surrender, they are being purified with every wince of pain, every moment of pain, their sins are being purified, they're being elevated spiritually. And I think the most important thing to remind, um, you know, anyone who's going through something like this, in this case, your sister, is that it's from Allah. You know, we, we're going to be tested, we all have tests. And there is a beautiful story of uh, Ibn um is it Ibn Al-Tayla? I'm so sorry, my mind, everything is frozen right now. I think it is Ibn Al-Tayla. Um, but there's a wonderful story about, and it's in my, if I can, I'll, maybe if you don't mind messaging me, but there is, um, anyway, it's it's a story about, you know, the, the four different ways that Allah tests us. And um, part of it is through tribulation. And, you know, but that doesn't mean that others aren't being tested too. So if you're going through something with your health, other people might have, you know, to attest to their relationships and their wealth and their um, mental health. There could be a plethora of different ways that we're tested, but we're all being tested. Sometimes what happens when you're going through a health problem is because the symptoms are so strong and you feel very immobilized or suddenly you're not able to do a lot that you did before. You feel like you're the only one being tested. So a good perspective is to just share you know these things these realities that everybody's being tested it's just your test is with your health but it's from Allah for a reason and there is um I can point you to this it's called the 17 benefits of tribulation uh look it up on YouTube Shahamza did a beautiful talk it's been around for a really long time but that talk has brought much healing to many people who've suffered uh, who are suffering through uh medical or physical ailments because it really brings things into perspective that there are actually benefits to being tested in this way but may Allah give her shifa you can of course continue to uh find means to help her I would definitely look into functional med medicine there are healers or hakims um Dr. Mazen Atasi is great uh he has um what's his page called let me see if I can find it real quickly um oh gosh I should know it sorry uh Mazen. Yeah, here he is. What is his page called? Well, you can look him up. Oh, a forward to health. Forward dot to health is his um he's a homeopath, a holistic uh medical practitioner. I would definitely look to these types of means in order to um you know find healing because medical, like just allopathic medicine is very black and white sometimes, and they kind of give people these harsh horrible sentences of like doom and death and it's just terrible but you'll find subhanAllah people of other practices who are much more optimistic and actually try to really work to find underlying reasons for especially with autoimmune how to heal so find those types of resources continue to make dua for her shifa and then have that talk um have her listen to that talk i think it'll really shape help her with her understanding of her tribulation some of us work full time and have to cook or exercise and do other obligations after work hours. So most of the day is gone. How do we stop feeling guilty not doing the hajjah and reading more Quran? So it's a good, good question. And I think, you know, as we mentioned, you want to take it easy. Don't try to do everything all at once. So I would say for the time being, if the hajjah is difficult for you because of time constraints and you have other obligations, then, then uh, read Quran. Because Quran, you can do any other, every time of the day, any time of the day, right? It's not relegated to a specific hour or or time frame um but just to mention it the the quran that is best uh or or that is often said is is a witness it's in the quran that it's witnesses the quran at fajr so there is immense reward in reciting quran at fajr and if you can add that as part of your fajr routine where you wake up for fajr and immediately you know, have a page, half a page, even some of these apps have these really great reminders where they come up, pop up, but it's your point of reflecting. You can be a verse every day where you just take a moment to reflect, start with that. And the goal is always to habituate to things for 40 days. This is what our scholars have traditionally said, try that for 40 days and then move on to the next thing. And inshallah, that should assuage your your guilt, you know, because if you're doing something and you start to see progress, then inshallah, shaitan and your nafs can't try to play those guilt games with you, right? 
So alhamdulillah. Let's see, any other questions? I think, was that? That was one. Oh, thank you so much um, for all of your kind words and duas and your hearts, your love. I really appreciate it. And I ha we have to share some of that with Osada Fadwa because she's she's the one who's putting, help us put all this together. Um, is adjust a better word than lower? Sure, I don't know what I said in that context, but I like adjust, go for it. Thank you for helping me if I, oh, I think it might've been because I kept saying lower standards. Maybe that, what's you're talking about? Yeah, adjust your standards does sound a lot nicer. Thank you. I appreciate those types of gentle, subtle ways to be more tactful. Yeah, well, um, let's see. Anything else here? So, yeah, documents. So a lot of the questions that I'm seeing or comments are about the document, um, I think, which is my favorite party. Uh, that's a very nice question. I have a few. Um, like Mishadi, of course, is amazing. I love Husari for Tajweed. He's really good. Um, mashallah but I'm sure there are others. Okay, so I'm just quickly scanning, make sure I don't forget anything. We don't wanna hold ourselves accountable. We always complain that we do not feel connected to our prayer. That's a very good question. I mean, very good point, right? I'm sure even our laziness is tied to what we put in our body. Absolutely, there is a total connection between the foods that we eat. Um, food is supposed to be nourishing. That's why we eat from the best. Allah SWT literally tells us to eat from the best, right? We are supposed to, actually take uh, effort to try to find the best ingredients, the best food. But most of the time we, we just fall into what um, shortcuts because we're moving about life so quickly. So then we, we're going to suffer the consequences, right? So it's really important to just take accountability and say, you know what, it's not that I'm tired and I'm exhausted and, or, or sorry, it's not that prayer is so difficult to do because that is a, a total, again, uh, cop out. It's not prayer is difficult to do. Prayer actually is very easy to do. But if your body is heavy because you're not eating good food, you're not resting, you're staying up all night watching, you know, YouTube or, or Netflix, and you're not getting enough sleep so that your body feels really heavy, then you are the reason why prayer is difficult. Don't blame the prayer. That is a cop out. Uh, accountability is how we reset ourselves. But when we're always um, passing the buck, as they say, or, or, you know, just absolving ourselves from any accountability, we then will continue to slip because you're not, there's nothing motivating you to change. But once you start to face yourself and go, I am the reason why I'm making all these excuses. It's all in my control. Stop making excuses. Just do it. And then it's very beneficial to have good sahba because they hold you accountable. So alhamdulillah. All right, brothers and sisters, I want to thank all of you I don't know how many people came in this room, but I saw a lot of people in and out, in and out. It's like a revolving door on Instagram, so it's hard to gauge. I hope you found this beneficial. If you did, I'm going to ask you. She did not ask me to do this, but the Rahma Foundation is one of my favorite organizations on the planet because, mashallah, tabarakallah, they're very, very committed to providing platforms like this for women, first of all, to learn from other women. Um, in this case, you know, I'm open with, with my content. I don't mind it being co-ed if, if brothers want to share, but most of their programming is for women, providing women teachers uh, or uh, classes with women teachers. And mashallah, we know, of course, Dr. Rania Awad, may Allah bless her. She is uh, the found, uh, founder, co-founder, along with Ustad Fadwa and others, uh, half of the Suzanne Dirani, Ustad Shamira Chothia. We have sister um, Ruhi Ahmed. They're a beautiful, incredible team of women who have been working for more than 10 years to try to provide these types of classes. So if you enjoy this, this is free. Nobody's charging you anything. Um, the content is all available, but support goes a long way. And it really means a lot when female-led initiatives are supported. We are the first uh, homes, I mean, the first madrasas of our children. So if you want to see our ummah thrive, please support female teachers. Um, just support female-led initiatives because we are going to hopefully be impactful with future generations. And if you look at all of our great scholars, many of them, if you read their, their biographies, they themselves will say it was their mother, their grandmother, their you know aunt, who, someone, a female, who was instrumental in putting them on the path of knowledge. So if we want our societies to flourish and our communities to flourish, we have to support women doing amazing things. And Alhamdulillah Rahman Foundation does that by providing these types of programs, but support them, inshallah. Support them by 
liking their page, by uh, sharing their content, uh, making dot for them. And if you are financially able to, why not also donate to them? But I want to thank again, uh, Sada Fadwa and everybody else. I know it's been a very long session today, but it's the last one, inshallah, for this class. We might, uh, we'll, we'll probably hopefully do something else soon, but keep us in your dua. I'm going to go ahead and end in uh, dua, unless, uh, Sada Fadwa, did you have any announcements or anything that you want to make before we end the call? Final announcements? Uh, I just want to take some time on behalf of the Rahma Foundation and upon myself to just thank you, Sada Hosai, for your patience, your insistence in completing the text, the blessing. I don't know if everybody realizes the blessing of completing a text, and it's an honor and a, and a pleasure to, ha to have completed this text with you. Um, you know, having you took this knowledge from our sheikh, and so for to have you deliver this to others is just alhamdulillah, a blessing to witness uh, and an honor to, to be a part of. So, of course, uh, please, for those of you who are listening, uh, stay connected to, to Ustada Hosai and the Rahma Foundation if you can, because we are planning a next course with Ustada Hosai. We do not want to let her go <laughs> without, inshallah, continuing the benefit that she provides for everybody. So please stay connected both to her on social media if you're able to, and as well, uh, the Rahma Foundation, um, so that we can keep you in tune with what we're doing. I have made some requests. I don't want to name them, but we have put them in the universe for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept so that we can uh, continue working together, inshallah. Uh, she's probably one of the biggest blessings in my life, so I appreciate the time that she gives us. Thank you again, Stada Hussai. And with that, inshallah, a closing dua and some... Fiki, mashallah. Likewise, you know how much you mean to me. I love you for the sake of Allah. And alhamdulillah for beautiful company. Wallahi, if there's... A dua that you want to make every day is to continue ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve uh, your the, the friendships that you have that really remind you of him. And if you don't have that, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you beautiful company because it's uh it's invaluable really to have uh, people like Ustada Fadu in your life and others who inspire you, who uplift you. Alhamdulillah wa shukurillah for beautiful company. So alhamdulillah, jazakumullah khairan. I'm seeing, I'm sorry, so, someone... Um, are, is, uh, someone's asking, is there a link for those who are watching through the Rahma Foundation? So um, I think if you just contact the Rahma Foundation's Instagram page, they can probably send you that. Um, and I don't know, someone else said that their battery died, they had a question. I don't know, sister, if you've already answered your question or asked your question, but I hope I answered it. And then someone else said, please make God for those of us struggling to improve and stay on track. I mean, you know, I mean, we're all struggling, honestly, sister. It's, uh, it's, this is life. Life is struggle, but there's beauty in struggling for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's never a burden when it's for Allah. It's always beautiful. It's always meaningful. And alhamdulillah for having purpose and direction in life, because there are a lot of people who have no idea what they're doing and they were never given the gift of guidance. So alhamdulillah, even if it's difficult, it's still better, much better than uh, floating in the abyss of dunya with no direction and no guidance. Alhamdulillah, may Allah protect us all. Inshallah, I hope the, the live will be saved. If not, the recording will be available on the Rahma Foundation. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and stop so we can pray Asr, inshallah, and make our final dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasu bil-haqqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruku wa natsubu ilayk. Allahumma salam wa salam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يسكون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاك الله خيرا again everyone thank you so much inshallah i hope you all have a wonderful remainder of your monday evening inshallah please keep us in your dua and until next time wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh